Three keys to digital transformation priorities, change management in cloud software deployments, and the top interviews of 2023. Those are just a few of the topics we're going to cover here in episode 151 of Transformation Ground Control. This is Transformation Ground Control. Your source for all things business, technology, strategy, and change. If you're growing your business, leading change within your organization, or undertaking any sort of operational or technology change initiative, this podcast is for you. This show covers what you need to know about digital transformation, organizational change, operational improvement, and business growth. Five, four, three, two, one. And now, here's your host, Eric Kimberly. Hello, welcome to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 151. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Kyler Cheatham. This is the podcast that has everything to do with digital transformation, including the strategy, people, process, and technology size of change. The podcast is produced by Major Tom Productions and sponsored by Third Stage Consulting. So thank you for being here today. And uh, Kyler, thank you for being here as always. Yeah, happy to be here. Excited for this episode. I'm excited too. We're going to cover a lot of stuff. It's going to be another epic episode. We're going to cover a lot of ground. We're going to open up our opening segment with some questions from the audience, as well as some hot topics. And the two hot topics we'll cover here today are three keys to digital transformation priorities, as well as diving into some of the recent acquisitions by IBM, some of the software platforms they've recently acquired. We want to cover that here today. And then later in the show, we are going to have our first guest, uh, Brad Feeks from Estes Group. He's going to be on the show chatting with me about change management, the organizational change and the people side of change as it relates to cloud migrations in particular. So be sure to stick around for that. And then later in the show, we're going to have Kyler's picks for the top five interviews from this podcast in 2023. So we're going to do a little countdown of the top five interviews of the year in review. So look forward to uh, to that discussion as we head into and start 2024. We'll look back at 2023 and pick out uh, five of the interviews that we thought were the most compelling, and the most interesting uh, for the audience here today. So before we get to uh, all the great content and guests we have here today, Kyler, what are some of these uh, questions you have in store from us, for us from the audience? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so these questions are from all of our third stage channels, um, as well as Major Tom and also Eric's personal channel. So anywhere that you're um, commenting, we go and we collect those and we bring them to them in real time. So I encourage you to not only comment your questions wherever you're viewing today, but also answer the questions, help Eric out um, as we put him in the hot seat here. So our three questions today, one is about costs. That seems to be something that's, you know, top of mind as we go into 2024 budgets. So this question actually says, what are some cost effective cloud based ERP solutions do we still have to go through all of those licensing fees or now are we moving into more of a subscription-based model that can not break the bank for smaller to mid-sized companies? Yeah, I think there are certainly some options out there that are more cost-effective, especially for small and mid-sized organizations. Um, you have some providers um, such as, for example, a couple that come to mind are um, HubSpot and Odoo. Um, HubSpot is not a full-blown ERP system per se, but it's a CRM and marketing automation system with some other capabilities. But they're just two examples that come to mind between HubSpot and, and Odoo, which is a full ERP system um, that provides sort of a free trial versions of the software, a way to sort of test it out and try it out. And then, of course, they get you, you know, the way they get you is when you decide to use more advanced functionality or add more licenses, that's when they start charging you. So it's sort of that freemium model that you're starting to see with some software vendors. Um, there are still some vendors like, uh, for example, Oracle NetSuite and, and others that are um, a little bit more difficult to try out in that way. They're going to be more expensive and, you know, they're going to stick to their subscription licensing or the subscription cost and whatnot. So the options are out there. They're just, uh, they might be a little few and far between, but there are more options now, certainly than you had just a few years ago. Absolutely. And definitely something to look at in that evaluation process. And that's really the time to really look at what is the, not only what's your budget, but what's the cost benefit analysis of this new tool within your environment, whether you are small or very large, those are all really healthy um, habits to, to look at. So this other question is really interesting one. Um, it talks about SAP specifically. So 
The question is, how can environments with limited manpower effectively manage a robust system like SAP, especially when they're preoccupied with resolving specific issues? This user reference uh, counting and operations, but I'll make it a bit more broad to talk about when you do have kind of an, a troubled area or an area of focus, whether it's industry or internal, how do you ensure that you can manage a system like that at that size? Yeah, as far as how to how to ensure that you're maintaining the system or, or what exactly, where, what's the what's the question? Maybe you rephrase the question if you don't mind. Sure, absolutely. So to simplify, for SAP, it's a large, very complex system. What if you don't have the internal competencies or the manpower to actually lift a system or manage a system of that size and complexity? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and you know, I'd say, first of all, if you don't have the manpower to handle a system like that, you should probably rethink whether or not that's the right system for you. Um, or at the very least, you think you, you have to plan ahead for the costs associated with that. So if you have to invest in full-time resources or support resources to maintain and manage the system, which is very, you know, it's a very valid point because SAP does require, um, in many cases, a broader or a bigger skill set, a bigger um, staff to support the product than if, than if you compare it to, you know, a simpler ERP system. So you do have to factor that in. And if you can't commit the cost or you can't open up the resources and provide the resources internally, then you quite frankly, you want to, I would rethink that strategy and say, is the SAP the right product for us? Or might we find a lower cost, lower, easier to maintain type of system? Maybe it doesn't give us all the ROI and the capabilities and the functionality we want, but it's something that's more right size to who we are as an organization. That's not the worst thing in the world. So you're, you're probably better off going that route rather than trying to force fit something like an SAP to fit in a situation where you may not have the right skill set in, in house. Absolutely. I think that's a, a, a great overall summary of that from the managed side. And then also, I'll take it like one step deeper, Eric. And when you look at SAP consultants specifically, we can see armies of consultants coming to SAP implementations. How do you ensure that you, you manage on the actual implementation side um, that you're doing that in an effective way? Yeah, it's, it's difficult because SAP and some of these bigger ERP systems are such a black box of functionality and, and you, you rely heavily on your outside technical implementers to, um, to, to do the implementation. But, you know, it's, it's hard if you're not educated, it's hard to know, you know, should we have 10 full-time people on this project from the outside helping support it? Or is it 20? Or is it five? You know, you, it's hard to know unless you've done these sorts of projects before. And so that's where having program management and program management support from objective, knowledgeable resources that can help manage that and make sure you're not running at too high of a, a burn rate during the project is really important. I think one of the most common things that happens that's, I don't know if it's unintentional. I don't know how much of this is unintentional versus intentional from software vendors, but, uh, but it really doesn't matter because the net impact to the organizations, to the end customers is the same. And that, that uh, nuance or that dynamic that we often see is that organizations software vendors and, and implementers will assume, let's just say an 18 month implementation. So we're going to staff up this project as though it's going to be an 18 month implementation. But the problem is oftentimes the it, more often than not, those implementation durations that are estimated are overly optimistic. And so in other words, instead of 18 months, it was never going to be 18 months. It was always going to be, let's just say 24 months. But the problem is we've staffed it as though we're going to deliver it in 18 months. When it turns into 24 months, it's not like we just spread those costs over 24 months. Now you've you've run at that higher run rate and you've wasted time and money because you overstaffed from the outside with that expensive outside consultants. So one of the keys is just to make sure you have a realistic duration and a realistic resource plan based on reality and not based on best case scenario. Because it's in the software's best, the software vendors and the implementers' best interest to really staff up the project as much as they can and implement as fast as they can. But that's not necessarily in your best interest, even though that sounds counterintuitive. It faster is not always better. Sometimes you need to take longer to get it right and, and that sort of thing. So you want to make sure you staff it and 
run at the right the right run rate, the right burn rate, so you're not burning through too much of your budget too soon. I think that relationship is so important when you do look at whether it's a system integrator or a third party independent consultant. Just understanding all agendas and having that level of respectful professional skepticism to really understand that a lot of times when you see SAP, that's dollar signs because that means there's likely a lot of budget there. <laughs> so um, right. definitely something to to consider. And this question actually fits really nicely with this conversation um, from one of your YouTube videos on benefits realization. Um, this user said, I'm struggling to look at benefits realization without all of the vendor marketing materials. Do you have a guide or a methodology that can help with that biases? Yeah. You know, one of the best things you could do is, is create an objective business case based on your actual performance now and the, the potential performance when you've defined your future state processes. So it's got to be a, you can't just take generic marketing material and say that we're going to reduce SG&A costs by 20% because that's the average of what, you know, a, a software vendor's customer realizes. Um, you have to look at your own operations, your own opportunities for improvement, look at how you're going to change your processes and how the tool is going to actually give you measurable business benefits. And that requires a certain amount of granularity that requires you going deeper than just the typical marketing collateral and the, the high level metrics that a, that a software vendor might provide you. Even if you look at like Gartner data, um, that's, that's a good starting point. It's a good reference point, but it's usually not relevant to you. Um, we publish data as well. We publish top 10 rankings of ERP systems. We, we publish data related to average benefits realization, things of that nature. It's all, it's helpful stuff. We put it out there too, to help people, but you can't take it at face value, you have to tailor whatever the specific opportunities for improvement are within your organization and, and quantify it accordingly. Right. Absolutely. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, when it comes to looking at that too, from a resource perspective, I'll just add, we do have, as you mentioned, we publish our data, but we have our 2024 report, um, which is uh, our digital enterprise operations report, which contains a lot of top 10 lists. So that's a great resource that we uh, completely do without any vendor influence. Um, it's just published by third stage. And then we also have our 2024 boot camp. Um, that we will offer um, as well that you can actually join live and ask questions. It's a completely free boot camp for this process um, in general and getting those 2024 strategies and really understanding the basics around whether you're involved in implementation or you're just you know, re-strategizing and organizing around what that looks like. Um, that's a, a good time to be able to do those. So those are the two other resources I would add besides, of course, Eric's videos and really kind of digging into those. Um, so with that, I know that we're going to talk through a few other kind of key hot topics that are happening in the industry too. And having that benefit of that knowledge is, is so key to ensuring that you're kind of on the forefront of digital transformation, what that looks like in the industry as well. So I know we're going to get to that in just a few minutes here. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to take a quick break. We'll get into some hot topics here. We're going to cover the three keys to digital transformation priorities as well as talking about IBM's recent acquisitions of some software platforms in the industry. So we'll get to those hot topics here in just a moment. And then later in the show, stay tuned because we'll have our first guest on, uh, Brad Feeks, who's the president of Estes Group. He's going to be on talking about change management in cloud software and the organizational change aspects of cloud migrations. And then last but not least, we'll get to the top five interviews of 2023. Uh, Kyler's picks for the top five interviews that we've done on this podcast so far in 2023. So stick around for that. Uh, we're going to get to these hot topics here in just a moment, but first we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with more Transformation Ground Control. Hi, my name is Eric Kimberling. I'm your host here on Transformation Ground Control. And if you haven't already, I want to invite you to buy my new book. It's called The Final Countdown, Strategies to Reach the Third Stage of Digital Transformation. It's my first book. I'm very proud of it. I love this book, and it, it was my attempt to create a summary and a playbook for what it takes to be successful in defining a digital strategy and a roadmap for your organization. So there's a lot of things we can cover when we talk about digital transformation. We talk about a lot of stuff on this show, but I wanted to condense it into a readable sort of a sequential format that made it easy to help define a digital strategy for project teams that is unique to your organization, unique to your goals and objectives. So really uh, hope you'll, you'll read it. I hope you enjoy it. Again, it's called The Final Countdown. You can read that book by 
scanning the QR code right here in front of you, or you can go to thefinalcountdown.com. Um, again, it's it's been an Amazon bestseller since it came out, so I encourage uh, you to check it out and love to hear your views and your comments on it too. So The Final Countdown, my new book, you can go to thefinalcountdown.com or scan the QR code in front of you. Hope you enjoy, and we'll see you soon. Hello, welcome to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 151. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Kyla Cheatham. You can find new episodes of the show every Wednesday at transformationgroundcontrol.com. You can also go back and view and listen to past episodes of the show as well. And again, that website is transformationgroundcontrol.com. So be sure to check that out for all the episodes you might have missed and to keep up with uh, new episodes as they come out as well. Um, so, uh, Kyler, you've got a couple hot topics in mind for us here today. They're very timely. What, what do you have in store for us? Yeah, well, let's let's talk first before we get into those key priorities about some movement in the industry um, and IBM's acquisition of two technology platforms. Um, there are two platforms from Software AG, and they were they acquired them um, for two point two billion dollars. Um, so this is something that we talk a lot about on here, looking at smaller platforms that are acquired by bigger platforms um, and what that looks like as far as the industry. And so just to give you kind of some background and we'll kind of dig into your thoughts around it, um, the acquisition, the details around it, they purchased stream sets and then web methodology, web methods, excuse me, um, that are two of AG's tech platforms. And really what they're doing is they're trying to strengthen application integration, API management, and data integration in specific sectors. Um, so those are really what they went out and purchased these smaller, more niche areas um, to actually support more of that interoperability, which I know that's a, a main trend on your 2024 trends list. Um, the interesting part about this, Eric, that I think is they always find a way, right, to make it make it completely hard for the user. But so these platforms will now only integrate with IBM. So the management tools so that, you know, again, kind of gets you in that bigger vendor lock in. Um, and I'm I'm wondering that when we see these these um, third party applications kind of gobbled up by these bigger titans in the industry. Does it put your integrations and your overall interoperability strategies at risk when those platforms that you may use are acquired? Yeah, it could, especially if it's locking you in, you know, if the whole idea and the strategy is to lock you into a certain vendor, then yes, it, it does. Um, the only way it really helps you is if you're already in this case, an IBM shop, you're already using IBM products, then you're, you know, it's probably going to help you. But if you're like most organizations and you've got multiple vendors and multiple solutions you're you're working with, um, this is going to make it more difficult, you know. And then you're going to have to have a trade off or a decision to make of do we do we give up that operability and, and just sort of lock ourselves into one vendor and is that okay? Does that give us the value we need, or do we need to go find another interoperable solution that uh, allows us to accomplish the same thing without the vendor lock in? Which is why most organizations do the interoperability model so they don't have to be locked into one vendor so sort of counterintuitive i see why ibm does it it's you know it's, it's a way to move more people to the ibm eco ecosystem but it doesn't necessarily benefit all of their customers and i think what's interesting is i learned from this conversation is a lot of these platforms you think that they support like very small businesses but just to give you an idea the global clientele and a reason why ibm kind of wanted to move um, towards this in the European or EMEA marketplace, we have a, a really big um, client list that these software AG platforms actually support. So we have things like Airbus, um, Texaco, Australian Post, Simmons, the United States Army. So those are not small organizations that now, you know, have to kind of take on what that looks like um, for that movement in the industry, but definitely something that I'd love to hear from the audience about. What are your thoughts around kind of those merger and acquisitions when it comes to smaller platforms, specifically with integration factors? Yeah. Yeah. Great point. I'd love to hear the audience feedback as well. 
So let's move on to these three key digital transformation priorities. And these are really interesting. This is an article from CIO.com. And it's something that we've talked in kind of a, a smaller level, but we haven't really like identified these three key priorities that this research shows. So I wanted to bring them to you and, and see what your thoughts were. Um, so, the, so the first one is generative AI work streams. Um, and they actually, they say that you should have six generative AI work streams that include large language models, establishing organizational guide rails, and just generative AI in general, like ChatGPT. Um, so they say that a lot of this is, is about overcoming execution gaps and ensuring that more machine learning models make production and ad adapting data um, more successful. So that's the first one. So before I kind of get into the second one, what are your thoughts about creating those specifically those six AI work streams? I think it's good because it unpacks what AI is and how it can be embedded within an organization. So I think it's a, it's a great way to add some guardrails and some structure to how AI is used and how it can improve a business versus it becoming too much of a free for all. Absolutely. Definitely something that I'm really looking forward to hearing more about on more of that granular definition based level too. Um, as well. So number two is closing operational and security gaps. So they talk about digital transformation specifically as a competitive advantage through new digital products or softwares like we talk about a lot. But when it comes to those core competencies, a lot of times bringing in these new digital tools open the security gaps, um, which we've talked about before, but also more mistakes in project management. So they talked about the special attention that really needs to be paid to security practices through operational efficiencies so those gaps are closed. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah, I think that operational efficiency and just clear definition of how processes should work and what people's roles are within those processes, you know, that's one of the keys to making sure that, uh, that you're able to tighten up security in that way. Absolutely. Definitely something that showcases the focus on processes and operation, which is a huge thing, you know, we at third stage really support and, and um, talk about within our mission. Um, so the third one here is my favorite. So I'm curious to hear what you thought about, but they say the third key priority is actually developing digital transformation leaders within your organization. So it talks about the high demand for innovation and technology capabilities, but more kind of digital strategy specialists so that when you need to go through a new integration, operation, upgrades, which I know you kind of talk about um, when it comes to cloud migration later in the episode, but they, they talk about partnering with HR to really initiate these programs for developing the digital transformation practice and change management leaders in the organization. Um, and they feel like this balances the need for overcommitment and ensures successful delivery of all digital transformation goals. So that's the third one. Curious to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan and big proponent of organizations building their own internal competencies, um, even if it requires outside help to do it. And that's something we help our clients do is, is build the internal competency so that we can go away, so other consultants can go away, technical providers can go away, and you can ultimately manage and, and uh, you know, guide your own digital strategy and roadmap longer term. Uh, you know, you always want to find that right balance, of course, between getting that outside help and building the in-house competencies. But too often, organizations are overly dependent on outside help and they don't build the internal competencies themselves. So, yeah, I think it's the more you can do that, the more self-sufficient you're going to be, the less costly your digital transformations are going to be. And, uh, yeah, just the more right-sided or right uh, fit fit for your organization, fit for purpose it's going to be. Yeah, and who knows? A lot of those leadership um, transitions can build you the CIO of the future, right? You might have that program and 10 years from now, now you have a really healthy technology focused organization. Um, so I thought those, those were really well-rounded priorities too. We did a little technical, we did a little people, we did a little system processes. So um, definitely a great article, but turning to the audience, what are your top priorities around digital strategy within your organization or even for yourself? Um, this next year. And I'd be interested to hear from what that looks like for our network specifically in this conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Love to hear the audience feedback here as always. And uh, 
And speaking of audience feedback, actually, we're going to take a bunch of audience questions in our next uh, segment. We're going to have a, a guest on the show talking about change management in cloud software migration. So we're going <clears> to <throat> talk about the human impact and the people impact of, of cloud migrations. And we're going to have Brad Feeks on the show to help us through that conversation. He's the president of Estes Group. So we'll be chatting with him here in just a moment. And then later in the show, after Brad is on the show, we'll do our little countdown of the top five interviews of 2023 so far. So we're going to get to that later in the show. So stick around for that too, especially if you want to see what the best highlights are that you may have missed throughout the year of episodes here. And by the way, if you have missed episodes, which you probably have, I doubt you've seen all of our episodes, but if you haven't seen them all, you can go to transformationgroundcontrol.com and cherry pick the ones you want to see and watch them all if you want to. So uh, be sure to check that out, transformationgroundcontrol.com. And uh, in the meantime, though, we'll play the five interviews that we thought were the most impactful for 2023. So we're going to have Brad on the show here in just a moment talking about change management and cloud software migrations. We'll be right back with Transformation Ground Control. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstage-consulting.com. Welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 151. My name is Eric Kimberly here with Kyler Cheatham, and you can find new episodes of this show every Wednesday at transformationgroundcontrol.com. You can also go to transformationgroundcontrol.com to view past episodes of the show as well. And uh, this podcast is produced by Major Tom Productions and sponsored by Third Stage Consulting. So thank you for being here today. Um, Third Stage Consulting is an independent and tech agnostic consulting firm that helps clients throughout the world reach the third stage of digital transformation success. So I'm excited for our next guest. He's a repeat guest. I think this is going to be, I don't know, the third or fourth time he's been on the show. We'll have to validate that with him here in a moment. But He's been on the show before chatting about various different topics. And today we're going to have him on the show talking about change management and sort of the people implications of cloud software migrations. So with all that being said, uh, Brad, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks, Eric. Always glad to be here. Yeah, glad to have you. This is what your third time, I think I want to say, at least your third uh, time being on this podcast. Boy, by this point, I've lost count. It's uh, yeah. it's just one continuous stream here now in my my own background. So yeah, it's been a lot of fun every time. I mean, it's so much fun to be on this show. I mean, I'm sure it all blurs together. It's just, you're, you're it, it does. A, it, it, it's, it's, it's it's such does. a state it, of euphoria. <laughs> it's a veritable fever dream. Right. <laughs> Everyone's dream is to be on this podcast. Um, so tell me a little bit about, tell us a little bit about your background. You and I have known each other for years now, but tell us for those that don't know, a little bit about your background and also about Estes Group as well. Sure. So I've been with Estes now for about 10 years, just a little under now. And, uh, so my background came from end user ERP based, worked for a company out of central Minnesota. Uh, we were implementing Epicor across the organization. At the time we were like a $700 million company. So a pretty large implementation from an Epicor standpoint, multi-company, multi-site, a lot of those variables in play. And I got pulled in from one of the, the local companies and one of the divisions into the headquarters. So kind of learned some of those centralized ERP and centralized IT uh, mechanisms over the course of, of that transition. Uh, after that transition kind of came to its, its conclusion, uh, some old friends in the consulting business uh, pulled me into Estes Group and I, and I started training and learning about uh, ERP from a consultant's perspective versus a power user, a core team member. And uh, over the course with Estes, we've really been trying to figure out the migration of ERP is simply location versus a set of IT services that we found ourselves increasingly providing customers based on their needs, uh, including 
the applications hosting, uh, cloud-based activities, integration development, third-party applications. So we found ourselves getting pulled into that broader ERP ecosystem. As a, as a system integrator, we often were kind of hands-off with, with a lot of that server side uh, stuff early in my career. And as I got deeper and deeper, and as, as Estes Group itself transformed over time, we've come to focus on that the server instantiation of the product to a much greater degree. So that for me has been kind of this eye-opening experience of, of what's behind the proverbial curtain. Yeah, absolutely. So you've gotten to see uh, the, the evolution of cloud solutions. And we're going to dive into that here, obviously, here today, as far as talking about what I think you've the heard. evolution of cloud software. Oh, do you hear me OK? Oh, we're back. <laughs> you, you froze with your eyes okay, closed, so I thought I'd yes, put you to sleep. Look. I apologize. <laughs> I, I mean, I did fall asleep, but no, <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, no, hopefully we don't have any more technical issues. But what, what I was going to say is you've seen the evolution of cloud solutions in your in your time, not only at Estes, but even prior to that. And, and that's certainly something we're going to dive into here today is the uh, the evolution of cloud and how it affects organizations and, and project teams in particular. Um, before I jump into some of the questions, though, and thank you for that that overview, um, I want to turn to the audience and thank uh, thank you all for dropping in the chat where you're joining from today. Uh, we've got people all over the world joining here today, as always, from uh, UK, India, Denver, Colorado, Houston, Texas, London, UK, uh, Dubai, India, Amsterdam, Reston, Virginia, Iraq, Prague. So people from all over the world. So thank you for being here today on all the different platforms. We're streaming to YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. So. Um, we're watching the chat here. So wherever you're joining, thanks for being here and be sure to drop in the chat uh, any questions you have here along the way. Um, so, so Brad, in your experience then, um, you've seen this evolution from on-prem to now cloud solutions and, and sort of the, the different iterations of cloud solutions as they continue to mature and evolve. But how would you say cloud migrations in general, just generally speaking, how are cloud migrations different from on-premise implementations of the past and sort of what's What's the real net impact or how's the net impact different to organizations implementing a cloud solution versus a uh, an on-premise solution? Okay, well, with an on with a on-premise solution, the server tends to be your biggest constraint. A project cannot begin until you have hardware to install. And I've seen countless situations where hardware delays lead to project delays. And now you're trying to implement a 12-month project in nine months because the server spin-up took so long. With cloud configurations, you avoid a lot of those challenges, whether it's a public cloud SaaS-based deployment or a private cloud deployment, which private clouds tend to be much more like an on-premise in terms of the architecture, dedicated resource, no risk of oversubscription, things like that. You're looking at a, a very closed envelope of an ecosystem, whereas in a SaaS world, it's much more, the curtain is much firmer. It's one of those fire curtains, right? You know, the fear in the, the 1900s of, of uh, audiences burning down because of the lack of fire control. So you have these big, thick, asbestos-laden fire curtains, wonderful things. Um, those, you, you have mu much tighter curtain in the SaaS world of knowing uh, where the, the application sits, what other competing applications and systems are, are sharing resources, how the data database is structured. You change when you migrate into a, a pure SaaS, you're, you're basically uh, outsourcing the entire process to your provider to say, take the application, take the database, take the whole thing, take the integrations even, and and work and, and make those work for us. And I'm going to consume that basically as an end user. So you, you get a company full of end users who are connecting through user interfaces to this uh, application. And that's why where the end user become, and the user interface become such an important part to a lot of customers who are in this world kind of the, where the topic has, has led from. So it really depends on the type of you know, application platform you're moving to in a private cloud world. Really, the, the key there is a good layout of what the ecosystem needs to look like. How many application servers? Do you have a single database or do you have a cluster? How do all those play together? And getting that organization spun up and set up in order to support a project implementation, if the project implementation is at its nascency, if you're, you're taking an existing ERP customer now, you're taking them and you're doing potentially a, a lift and shift where you just re-image their on-prem environment into a private cloud, or you build it up from scratch. And often when we're encountering 
upgrade situations, that might be a case where you need to build a new ecosystem from scratch that has the upgraded version to it. Again, that's an area where we run into this user interface challenge when we're upgrading a customer from a very old version to the latest and greatest. There's some, I don't want to call it sticker shock. It's more of a user interface screen shock. We'll call it screen shock. And our user community sometimes suffers screen shot. It's a, when, you, when you're so happy to show someone something and it's so bright and glistening that it blinds the, the, the person who's receiving it and they, they have to turn their head in disgust. It's an un, un, unfortunate and awkward event. Right. <laughs> I hadn't heard that before. What's the word again? How, what what would you describe the word as? Screen screen shock. Screen shock. Yes. So, well, let's build on that a little bit. How how um, you, you know I talked about this before we we came on live to, for this discussion. But one of the things that when you when you think about web based cloud solutions and the user interface that goes along with that and the ease of use and some of the net benefits that we're being sold as consumers of cloud solutions, it sounds like it's going to be a, a pretty easy adjustment. And so I guess the question would be, why, why is it not like, why, why are cloud migrations not mm -hmm. as easy as they might sound on the surface? Great. Perfect. So you're asking me to elaborate on screen shock, something that yes. I coined all of 45 seconds ago. So let's, let's dig in. So uh, first let's talk a little bit about um, ERP evolution because every ERP system has kind of its own narrative. Uh, I've been in the Epicor ecosystem for going on 20 years. So I've watched the Epicor ecosystem. It's the 20 year anniversary of Return of the King, I think right now, Lord of the Rings, great narrative there, very different. Not not as bloody as ERP, but um, so you have an ERP system. It goes through migrations where a system uh, was living on an old old uh, underlying database structure. It migrates to something new. Let's say Microsoft and SQL Server. It changes its backend instantiation. Then over time, it says, "Well, I need to change the way the users are actually interacting with the system." And why? Because if I'm trying to take my my legacy on-prem ERP system and turn it into a SaaS based purely cloud managed uh, ecosystem, I need the users to come along for the ride. So when you talk about SaaS as a version of cloud, software as a service, you're really talking about the server side of the application, the server instantiation, application server, database server, primarily. When you're talking about the client side, the user interface, that's where things like, you hear terms like fat client, desktop client, web UI. So that's the client side of the whole conversation. And those two can move independently. And I would say, I, again, I'm, I'm talking about Epicor because, well, it's the only system I know, which isn't entirely true. And you know, it's funny, uh, our colleague, Dan Aldridge, I met him and we started talking and we realized that we both had backgrounds in Bond. My first, my first love when it comes to ERP was actually the Bond system back in the late 90s. It's kind of like, you know, you meet a girl at the at the dance and you realize that you're both Pisces. It's kind of like that moment. Oh, you you were in Bond. Oh, that, that's not me, actually. I'm a Gemini. So, but the, the basic premise here is when you have a, an ERP system, Epicor is a good example. They migrated their server instantiations, gosh, must be 10 years ago when they, they came out with version 10. And that allowed for a SaaS based system, Microsoft SQL Server, real well performing and fine tuned over time. Now, the user interface is more recent, so they had a classic WinForm, at least in the kinetic version, they had a classic WinForm desktop fat client that inter interacted through the application server layer. Now, they had their other P21 database that was more of a two-tier versus a three-tier, no application server at all. So they took some of the lessons they learned with Epicor and that three-tier, N-tier uh, application server based, and they did something similar so they could also deploy that uh, to the cloud. Now, Along with that is, hey, I have this nice cloud-based ERP system that is really portable for the end user, provided that the end user has a portable means of accessing it. And desktop applications are, are the last thing when you think of portability. They're big, they're hogs of resources. They take up a lot of bandwidth. Sometimes you have to stick them on a terminal server farm because they'll, they'll tank your own PC if you try to use it locally. Um, so you get to a position where we need a portable vehicle for this great cloud solution that we have. What better thing than a browser-based web UI? So when we talk about web UI, we're talking about the application living inside of a web browser versus being a separately installed application on your computer. And with that, the change from a old version to a new really comes with your classic version upgrade cycle. All right, so I would think of the, the, the topic in my mind, I really kind of 
talked about this conundrum as a, a broader category of, of change management as it relates to version upgrades, because you, you can see there's a change management that comes with implementing a software initially, and there's similar and, and also unique in their own way strategies or issues that come up as you try to maintain that software, because every version implies change. And how big is that change going to be when you're changing the user interface, when you're changing the way the users are actually interacting with the system, you are moving their cheese pretty significantly. So for a user working on an old desktop system, suddenly now opening a browser and trying to do the same business processes, the changes can be significant. And so for us, what we've realized that creates all kinds of challenges in terms of getting customers to stay on a current version. Now, of course, you know, what's the importance of, you know, version maintenance to staying current? Most ERPs have, vendors have a certain like years of support, right? We'll support you X number of years back. After that, you're on your own. So it makes it harder and harder to keep your system bug free and highly performing. New features and functionalities aren't available to you. So there's a lot of reasons in general to try and keep your software up to date to some degree. I'm not a bleeding edge kind of guy. I wear a white shirt, blood doesn't look good on it. So I'm not a bleeding edge kind of guy, but I do like to keep things within the maintenance window for my customers. Um, right. You know, For vendors, there's, there's a similar version. If I have my customers all on our new version, I can have a, a, a more fine tuned group of, of users that I support. And the, the more users I support in terms of old versions, the more costly it is to do that. So vendors obviously have a reason to try and have, you know, fixed windows and then to work, you know, assertively with their customers to try and keep them coming along. And what, what made us kind of the uh, surprised by all this, we had done some, some polling with our users at conferences and user group meetings and found that uh, in some systems, like two thirds of the, the people we were talking were not completely off the old versions of the software. So these folks were living in no longer supported versions in spite of vendors' best efforts, in spite of integrators' best efforts to help pull them along. So it begged the question, so why is there this resistance to that version upgrade? Mm -hmm. And that's that's kind of the nexus of this whole conversation. Yeah, and I think where what you're touching on too is this, uh, I think we're, what we're both saying or what we're both challenging is that assumption that just because it's a web-based user interface in a cloud solution, presumably easier to use, pr presumably more intuitive, presumably more like the consumer grade technologies that we're used to using in our personal lives. We assume that because that those statements are probably true, that therefore adopting to the changes are going to be easy. But what you're saying, and I think where you're, we're getting at here is that end users and employees that are using technology, I don't think they judge technology as much as sometimes we think they do in the industry. I think they it, it's sort of a neutral, it's not good or bad. It's just the way the software is and the way they're used mm -hmm. to using it. And when you change that, even if it's for the better, it's a disruption, it's a learning curve, it's a challenge. In some cases, people don't like it because it's different. It might be better. It might be a you know easier, more intuitive solution to use, but that person isn't necessarily going to judge it in that way because it's different. Is that, I mean, would you agree with that? I've never have made that comment before, come to that conclusion until you were hearing you give that description there. I'm curious to see what you think though. Yeah, I think I think that's a really good depiction of, of where the user communities can stand in general. We're here with Brad Feeks talking about the people side of change and change management within cloud software migrations. We've got a lot more to cover. We're gonna take a quick break. We'll be right back with more Transformation Broadway. Interested in working for a company that truly values your unique skills and experience? Here at Third Stage, we don't hire based on resumes alone. We look at the full candidate, experience, and willingness to provide excellent service for our clients. Within a technology independent and agnostic consulting firm, you have the opportunity to learn across industries with a diverse group of clients. Our consultants also have the opportunity to diversify their portfolio and learn across technology systems. If you're interested in joining a high growth entrepreneurial organization, please reach out to us at work at thirdstage-consulting.com. Welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 151. My name is Eric Kimberling, here with Kyler Cheatham. You can find past episodes and new episodes of this show at transformationgroundcontrol.com. So be sure to check out that website, bookmark it, and uh, keep it 
locked in so you can see any new episodes that we publish each week. And uh, again, that's transformationgroundcontrol.com. We're here with Brad Feeks from Estes Group talking about change management in cloud software migrations. We've got a lot more to cover, so let's jump back into the conversation. I think a lot of our, our strategies in life too often are dictated by marketers and not by actual end users. So everyone says, oh, it needs to be hip. It needs to be cool. It needs to bring in the next generation. My son is a Zoomer and he's a much better coder than his old man. So I'm sure he would he would agree. But, you know, for anyone who has their own driver's license and owns their own car, you know, some of these things, the value and benefits of of more current technology that looks more like uh, your Twitter account the value is not necessarily there if you have to cut a purchase order and get it sent to a vendor in X amount of time with the right price and the right products, et cetera. All those uh, cosmetic features uh, can honestly become distractions if it is less efficient and effective for you to do their job. And what I find is and whenever you're moving to a new version, there's a certain number of kinks to work out. Some of those kinks are, are vendor driven. Some of those kinks are internal in terms of how you use the old system. Maybe you misuse the old system. Now, how do you migrate the misuse of an old system? There's a proverb that'll keep us thinking for a long time, scratching our heads. But you run into that sort of situation where how do you fine tune the use of this new application so that it continues to be as effective and efficient as possible for the end users and does not lose major bits of functionality because I've certainly seen with uh, nascent versions of web UIs as they've migrated, it's it's one of those oh, oh no moments where we forgot this one left click functionality here to do this special process that you used to be able to do in the old system. You can't do it in the new. How do you pull this process off? And sometimes these are game changing uh, stoppages of work for people. So you really find yourself in a situation where you have to work through all that, get through all of the cosmetic stuff and make sure that functionality wise, you can still support your user community. Yeah, yeah great point. And here's a question from Kyler. It's almost as though she was involved in our prep discussions, which she was not. But this is a great question that's right up right up our alley here with what we're talking about. Kyler on LinkedIn says, is, is upgrade really the right word here or is it a full new implementation when you're talking about a migration to a cloud solution? Hmm. So that's a, an interesting question. I would say that you need to, in certain instances, approach an upgrade like it is an implementation, like you are re-implementing the software, because in, in many senses of the word, you are the underlying data, the underlying business logic, which is all server side, is in, you know, in the context that we're talking about, largely untouched, but the way that it interacts with you as a user, so your, your business processes, your process flows, and your end user procedures could be radically different. So in those cases, I would say you're really, in, in a lot of ways, re-implementing the software. And there's probably a one big variable there that I would say it makes that different. And it's, it's an interesting another little case study here um, from the Epicor space. So Epicor has kind of two flagship ERP systems. They have their kinetic manufacturing and their profit 20 distribution. Now they've moved both of those to web user interfaces, but they did so kind of in radically different ways technically. So with Kinetic, they moved to an Angular JavaScript uh, user interface tool set and built a, a set of user interfaces that were dramatically different than the traditional WinForm Kinetic Vantage E10 screens that everyone was used to. In Profit 21, the web user interface looked a lot more like the original screens, the original WinForm screens. So it looked much more like traditional navigation in um, the Angular stuff. Things would collapse and expand. You had drill downs and see so you could really transform your screen much more significantly than you could in Profit 21. And interestingly enough, what we found, at least anecdotally, I don't have the full numbers because though that's more of a, a vendor thing. Uh, that what we found anecdotally is that the adoption rates inside of the Profit 20 world, world were more successful than they were in Kinetic. So the, uh, the cutoff date for the old versions in Profit 21 is a much harder date than it is in the Kinetic world. The pushback from the end user community, to put it another way, in Kinetic was much stronger. So the, uh, the I'm not even sure if there is a current no more support date for legacy fat clients solutions. I guess there's also a piece there is, you know, the original architecture of the web user interface, you could really customize them a lot in the old kinetic world. You could add a lot of C sharp code that did this and that, and you could, you could control the user experience in a way that 
um, the low code Angular JavaScript UI just doesn't support. It's much more of a low code environment that says if you want to do custom business logic, you got to send that to the server and call a function to do what you want versus doing it right here on the client side. So the um, migration of these complex screens at time that have you know, thousands of lines of, of code in them to modify that and push it all into a different architecture. It, it may not be a user uh, re-implementation, but for your IT staff or whoever is doing that, that technical work, it can be hugely significant. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and along those same lines, as sort of a follow up. This is from Dan on YouTube. Um, Dan Aldrich, who you just mentioned a moment ago that you and I both know. Uh, thanks for being here, Dan. Dan asked the question of, are you familiar with any AI enabled software to speed up the migration from on prem to cloud solutions? Can, so can you just use chat GPT to to do the the upgrade from uh, on prem yeah, to cloud? I have, I have not. Yeah, I have, I have not seen that myself. Um, code converters are, are certainly out there, but um, converting an apple into a pomegranate is not something I've seen AI pull off. Uh, I'm sure that if uh, someone wanted to put enough due diligence to working with that specifically in the context of one application, they could get there. But I have not seen anything um, myself that, that has helped in that area. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, here's a comment from LinkedIn, I apologize, I don't see who the who the person is, but the comment is, is agreed 100%. It's a disruption when you're upgrading to a new system or version. And there's a learning curve for sure. Effort should be made on how this learning curve can be reduced. It's all about to value each comp employee's learning curve. So I think that's probably the mm. really important point. If you have a highly tenured person who's been around for a long time, a lot of tribal knowledge, they know how to work all the exceptions, all the nuances of your business processes, they've figured out how to make it work within your current legacy systems for better or for worse. Now you throw in a cloud solution, a new user interface, and it's just, it's just different. Um, you know, one thing that you and I had talked about too, Brad, that along these same lines is that oftentimes with on-premise solutions or even private cloud solutions, you get a, a bit more flexibility in those solutions and that, you know, you, you've got your own instance of the software where you can make changes to it. You can customize it. You can change the code, do whatever you want. Whereas public cloud, or SaaS models where it's multi-tenant and you've got less flexibility on that front, you know, that can affect resistance to change as well. How do you, how do you see those two models being accepted differently by people within organizations or how does it affect the human side of, of change for organizations? Mm -hmm. Boy, yeah. So two, two different questions and, and two interesting ones at the same time. Um, so I've seen the interaction of web UI migration and SaaS migration or cloud migration of, as two kind of independent variables that easily overlap. Um, they overlap probably from a marketing standpoint. It's very helpful, I think, for vendors to, to associate web UI with SaaS, because if I can get you into the web UI, I can sell you my SaaS solution and transfer your license into a subscription base. So there's certainly some, some benefit there from, from that simple standpoint, which is why I think these two things get overlapped so much. But I tend to look at them as separate because they both have separate conundrums and, and conundrums and challenges. Uh, I would say in terms of looking at specific, specifically the web UI transition from an end user standpoint, uh, the key is I think finding, uh, and this goes back to the idea of re-implementation is, is providing enough time and effort to get into the new system and surface all of the things that are different and understanding what is the uh, mitigation strategy for differences. Now, these differences are truly bugs, things you have to go out and fix, something that was customized in the old version and you can fix it in the new in a different way, surfacing all of those things. Challenge, of course, is, is um, oh boy, this is drives us down another, let's go down one rabbit hole. We, 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 our rabbit hole's gone down. I'm making an auxiliary room here for some of the little bunnies here. Uh, ERP hygiene is a term that I think is really important because ER companies that have general ERP hygiene will be much better at upgrades. Uh, and when I say ERP hygiene, I mean, just a, a little fact, every time I do one of these webinars with you, the first thing I do before the cameras go on is make sure I'm wearing deodorant. It's not like you would know, but I would know. But in hygiene, you know, key e hygiene elements with customers tend to be, do I have a large super Super user community. I have a community of comfortable in the system and able to get in there, are not change averse and are willing to help work along, spend some time testing. 
they're the internal leaders of all the different divisions in terms of how this system interacts with the user experience. And that's a really important thing. Good comes with good ERP hygiene have built a strong power. All right. Another area there tends to be the opposite. You know, how big is your caveman community? Right. Cave citizens against virtually everything. Right. These are the people who threaten to quit when you implement a new ERP system. I'm in one right now where I have, uh, you know, you have change averse and you have cave and the caves are like, OK, I'm ready to retire early because the new system's taking away my my 40 year cheese and re real sharp cheddar by that time. Um, so that, that those are two kind of key pieces there. And uh, another would be the overall degree to which ERP is a business oriented versus a technical oriented solution for the organization is the business engaged in the solution and its use or is it just an it problem right the more that the business is organically engaged in the process the easier it'll be to surface issues cross train uh troubleshoot solutions and as as your your commenter had made that the idea of of no employee left behind if you have a lot of uh, power users who are deeply engaged in the community, uh, the ERP system community, they can help those other users, you know, keep pulling them forward. Uh, so that is kind of a, a healthy company makes for a healthy upgrade and that those two tend to go together. So quite often, you know, migrations like this surface a lot of business challenges with a, a community inside of that company that that might otherwise go unsurfaced in the day-to-day -day grind. So, you know, making sure that, you know, Kind of okay. okay, so out of that, out of that hygiene uh, rabbit hole, and up, we talk about the importance of how to best address a group of people inside of your community to minimize the challenge of of that migration. What I've found works. There's, there's kind of two different branches that people go into. They can do like a big bang upgrade, or they can do a incremental upgrade. Now, one of the interesting things about, and I'm going to use. Uh, Profit 21 specifically as the example, they have kind of a what I call a last branched version. It's they have the last version that supports both the leg legacy two tiered desktop <clears throat> and the future state three tiered web UI. And so that last branch version, half of the user community right now is on that version and too scared to go forward because of various members, users within their own company that is still on the desktop version. So the key here is when you're doing an, an incremental uh, implementation, if say you're on that version, is coming up with a strategy to not one, rip the Band-Aid, because if you rip the Band-Aid, we might all bleed to death. So you, you peel that Band-Aid off slowly by having your, your power users get into the system first on the website and start solving as many problems as possible and working in the web version of the user interface as much as possible. All right, that creates some critical mass and, and gets some of those easy problems solved. While you're doing that, you're working with your more challenged users. Some of these users might be like a whole department. Let's say uh, this is an easy system for the purchasing department to move to the web UI, but in sales, it's a much harder leap for whatever reason. Now, with your sales team, let's say you start scheduling, okay, uh, Monday and Tuesday afternoons, we're going to work in the web UI and we're going to conduct daily business in the web UI and we're only going to jump into the desktop if we run into a limitation, a bug, a defect, missing functionality, et cetera. And you do that over time and you start gauging people's comfort level. How are you doing? Uh, the most successful companies I've seen from a hygiene standpoint are constantly asking their users how comfortable they are with the use of the application and providing auxiliary training if needed, troubleshooting over the shoulder observation to help sort out things, and sometimes, yeah, dialing them back to the old system while we fix the new. And then over time, you incrementally try to make those blocks of larger and larger and larger. Your most difficult departments are working in the new system such that when you say, okay, when we are 90x percent comfortable with the system, we turn off the old and we move to the new. That is kind of the incremental version of this uh, migration path. And, and if you have a system that supports, you know, kind of a branched version, you can pull that off. And I found that has been one way to kind of coax your, your your team into migrating when change be their DNA. We're here with Brad Feeks talking about the people side of change and change management within cloud software migrations. We've got a lot more to cover. We're gonna take a quick break. We'll be right back with more Transformation Ground Control. I'm excited to share our newly released 
2024 Digital Enterprise Operations Report. This free download is available on the Third Stage website at thirdstage-consulting.com. This report is truly packed full of technology independent and agnostic insights for your project to ensure that you're strategically optimized for success. Download your copy today with the QR code in front of me or visit our website for more details. Welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 151. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Kyla Cheatham. You can find past episodes and new episodes of this show at transformationgroundcontrol.com. So be sure to check out that website, bookmark it, and uh, keep it locked in so you can see any new episodes that we publish each week. And uh, again, that's transformationgroundcontrol.com. We're here with Brad Feeks from Estes Group talking about change management in cloud software migrations. We've got a lot more to cover, so let's jump back into the conversation. We're, we're sort of dancing around this topic of change aversion, change resistance, um, how cloud has some obviously upside benefit to both vendors and customers, especially vendors, but there's also a dark side potentially to customers in that there is change resistance. So this is actually just a great pointed question here from Esther on LinkedIn, which is uh, probably a good way to dive into a little bit further. But what are some of the common reasons for resistance? Mm -hmm. I know you've already you've alluded to a few things here in passing as we've talked, but if we were to sort of summarize why mm -hmm why organizations or people within organizations tend to resist change to cloud-based solutions and or these you know sexy new web user interfaces why is it that people are resisting or what are the common reasons why people are resisting those sorts of changes oh boy so this delves into i think there's there's technical pieces and there's psychological pieces um i'm i'm not neither a good technician nor a psychologist um I would say that generally I, I see organizations have different tolerance of change at a management level. So one of the reasons will be uh, will be from management. And I'll say I'll see, we'll talk with a, one company and they'll be, well, if we have 1% diminution in efficiency, we can't do this. All right. There is lack of confidence in that 1% that they'll be able to catch that 1% up over time. So they'll demand a really rigorous and long process to get themselves over that hurdle. Other companies are much more um, cognizant of things like ramp up periods and, and learning curves such that they'll say, okay, if we're at 80%, we'll, we'll cut the cord at 80 and we know we'll ramp up within the next two months. And that'll be the, the plan. So we'll, we'll manage it and try to manage that change. So they're a little more likely to take the risk there. So it's a, a risk aversion level. You know, for companies that that work in especially uh, spiky environments, seasonal environments, where making all of your sales is really important during the summer season, having anything that is an encumbrance at that point could be a huge uh, problem. Because during the down season, if you've lost sales during the busy season because of a migration, now suddenly the business might be struggling. So you might find yourself having to plan within a off-season window. That's certainly one kind of logical thing. Uh, I would say that going back to management, I've also seen cases where uh, more of a hammer methodology than others. Some folks are real kumbaya, let's all get together and decide this together. Others are more like, okay, we're going to draw this line. We're going to take our time and make a good decision. But once we've made that decision, that, that line is firm in the sand and we're going to hold to it. And that's kind of the, the hammer management model that says, okay, guys, this is what we're doing. We need to make this work. Now go make this work. Um, I just tend to see that that assertive management in these kinds of things quite often uh, drives people to make uh, upgrades work and it requires a little bit of hammer and uh, companies that lack that hammer tend to stay on older and older versions so there's a certain amount of uh, uh, management that uh, assertiveness that really is required there now i think the, the problem when you get down to the end user level um, some of it has to do with uh, comfort level curiosity level uh, when you have something like a web UI, there, there will be certain people, and it's not even an age thing, I don't find. I, I, I know guys, you know, 50s, 60s, who are just immensely curious. So as soon as the new version's out there poking around, they're trying to see what they can do with it. It's, it has to do with a uh, level of curiosity overwhelming the level of fear. And uh, when you have folks who are uh, very fearful, uh, they tend to be very change averse. So if there's something where... I'm still running into folks in the ERP community who are very used to doing 
95% of their work in spreadsheets and even paper-based, and then finally taking their final answers and plugging them into the system in order to cut a purchase order or what have you. Those folks are going to be extremely difficult to get to something that has greater change of version, uh, change, you know, greater deal of pieces. Quite often, I found this goes back to my bond days, become experts in the organization based on their ability to perform workarounds. And if the new system takes those workarounds away, suddenly there's this domain of expertise that suddenly it's like you're you're in an engineering world where everybody moved to CAD and you're still the, the last best pencil and paper engineer on one of those big drafting tables. Suddenly the entire ecosystem underneath you has been pulled out from underneath you. Folks, folks can feel all kinds of challenges for that, especially if the learning curve of building kind of a, an interaction paradigm that's so different than what they've been used to. I think that that is an area that makes that, and it gets manifested in not as efficient in the new system as I was in the old. You're making me slower. So overcoming that challenge, because you know that we talked about the underlying cause, ultimate balance bottom line challenge there for the organization or at entering orders or we are slower at uh, processing purchase orders on time getting inventory in when needed all those things can create legitimate business challenges uh, so yeah everything ends up gearing around trying to mitigate some of those tangible challenges and I think that's honestly one of the best mitigation strategies is to be focusing not so much on the the why but the what you know what isn't working how do we fix it and keeping the emotionality out of it as much as and that it's there i think using emotionality as a technique to overcome these challenges is is probably not the most efficient use of time when it comes to planning a migration i think the key is you can sell the the changes to people and sell them on your ability to help handhold them through so they can get to their point of efficiency that they need i think that's generally the best way of trying to get people over the hurdle yeah yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I think the you know the key takeaway here is that uh, you used the comment earlier in the conversation about who moved my cheese. And anytime you move someone's cheese, even if it's a net gain to the organization and to you individually, there's going to be some resistance. There's going to be some road bumps, speed bumps along the way that's going to make it more difficult for people to adapt to that change. So I think that's something that's worth worth noting. Um, here's a comment from. Uh, I'm not going to put it on the screen because it's a very long comment, so I'm just going to read it. But it's more of a, a case study, if you will, a use case to sort of validating what you, you just mentioned, uh, Brad, which is the need to use a hammer in addition to some of the more finesse-based uh, change strategies. But this person on LinkedIn, and again, this is another one where I don't see um, the person's name, but the, the person says, here's what happened, interestingly, with one of my implementations. I was implementing ERP Next for a smaller company with 100 to 200 users. The, there were people of the so-called Stone Age who were hard-coded with a desktop-based accounting uh, inventory management system. There was obvious resistance about the failure of the new system providing certain features, although it had the features, but the process was different. And this is what happened. Top management just sent an email stating that we are implementing the new cloud ERP software for sure. Either you can use it or leave the company. I don't know if it's right or wrong, but that really helped in getting these people along the way, and we successfully implemented it. So... It, there's one data point here that suggests that there is a time and place mm -hmm. to use the hammer and say you are going to change, you are going to use this new um, this new system. Now, I, I wouldn't suggest that's your only uh, tool in the toolbox. You've got the hammer; you, you can use it uh, selectively, but you also do need the the more the more finesse based uh, ways of doing it. And like you said, it it probably depends on the person and whether they are open to change. If they're the type of person that likes to learn new systems and poke around and just really get their hands on it or are they someone that's more afraid of change and not wanting to to go through the change so mm -hmm. i think you have to sort of tailor your change strategies based on that yeah yeah i think uh, combining what and why is probably a good idea you know the what this is what we need to do why this is the logic behind what we're doing this is these are the business conditions that mandate us needing to do that if people understand the need i know quite often with this is more of an implementation than it is a uh, upgrade. But when a company is on a, on a dead server, like an AS400 system that is a ticking time bomb, and everybody says, yeah, we know it's a ticking time bomb. You remember back in July when the system went down and we were out for a week, we can't let that happen in the future. So there's a clear why of what we need to do that drives the what that says we must do. And so when you 
combine those two, uh, hopefully that sells over more people on where, where you need to go. Yeah. Now, now what about training? Here's a, here's a question on training, which is obviously a subset of change management and addressing resistance to change. But this is from Nima on LinkedIn. Nima says, how do you balance training based on the individual user needs and skill sets versus training at scale for the broad user base, especially in today's, you know, sort of standardized SaaS cloud environment? You know, how do you how do you tailor training, but at the same time scale it for a bigger, bigger user base? Yeah, that gets challenging. I think is as your user bases get larger, this challenge becomes increasingly nuanced. Um, I think again, it probably depends on the degree to which your system, your user community has uh, power users. One key piece here would be that training can be deployed through your power user base versus from your IT department. I've seen a lot of successful migrations and implementations drive training at that level. Um, so by the time the system is ready for use, the people who are rolling it out to the end users are not IT folks. They're the people who are in the trenches on their own. And so they can speak to the specific challenges much more readily and the gotchas and the did you think of this sorts of situations. So I think standardized training is one thing. Training delivery is probably another question. I think you've seen this as well, Eric. In 95% in of the failed implementations I've seen, one of the first things they say was inadequate training. So you always want to try to you know, from when I think about communication as a key element of change management, I think of um, communication going down to the end user. And it's not even uh, necessarily the, the the marketing end of communication, but rather training is a form of communication, right? It tells the user, I value your time and I value your presence here, that I'm going to educate you properly on the use of the system so that you can do be successful. So that's a, a big communication plan. So companies that fail at training fail at communication. I think that's a piece. Um, gauging users. I had mentioned this earlier of, well, how's your training going? Is your Is your adoption level, is your familiarity, comfort level with the application improving, or is it not? If you're if you're stuck in the mud here, we need to figure out how to uh, address that. So going back to the original question of, do you tailor it for each user or do you have a broad base? What I've seen co some companies do is you have a broad based set of training uh, techniques that you deploy and you're gauging your users constantly asking them, what's your comfort level? Now, of course, this re requires your end users to be honest and say, if if you're a one to five and you are you feel like you're a two, you shouldn't say you're a four. Why? Because you go live and suddenly you're a two. Um, and, you know, and so I, I often say the the motto, anybody who lies here refuse, uh, reneges the right to complain later, right? So it's, you gotta be honest at this point. And if, if people are feeling comfortable and in increasing their comfort level, okay, you keep with that standardized training, you have specialized training for individual users who are slower to adopt. And that's, again, a place where you can deploy your super users for some tailored one-on-one -on -one to help those folks kind of keep themselves ramped up. And then slowly you drag everyone up to that point. Also, if you're using a, a, an implementation method where you're doing incremental, where you have that branched version and you can kind of take people in two different paths, uh, you can really gauge who is, is is more slowly adopting and who isn't. And you can, the, the training sort of tailors itself, honestly, in terms of the people who are already, you know, 100% in a new system and, uh, and people who are not. We had that, uh, this would have been, oh boy, this was pre-print. So we weren't yet partying like it was 1999, but we had implemented a new MES system in the factory where I worked. And you got to that point where they were asking, well, how, how uh, good is the system version? versus the old paper-based system that preceded it. And, it. and we had some users who were, well, I, I don't use the paper-based system anymore. I can't compare anymore because I'm completely in the new system. I do 100% of my work in the new system. You realize, okay, that that gradual approach uh, allows your your early, early adopters to get in earlier and then kind of pull everyone along, hopefully. Hopefully they're the types of people who value pulling others along for the ride. That's not always the case. So because coaching matter with folks to make sure that your your superstar team build team orientation there yeah and also you know recognizing that training doesn't necessarily just need to be pre go live or right before go live end user training it's also a matter of walking people through the process changes along the way too so that by the time you show them how the system works in detail they've already sort of had their freak out moments they've already panicked about mm -hmm. how 
someone's moved their cheese and the process mm -hmm. is going to look totally different. My job's going to change. You sort of work through all that and then you get to end user training later on where now you're just showing them how it's going to look in the system. They've already sort of uh, adapted or they've already adjusted mentally to, to the cheese being mm -hmm. moved. So I think that's one of the key things too is to recognize that it's not just, I think too often we put too much pressure on user, end user training to sort of clean up any sort of change issue mm -hmm. we might have. And we hope that 30 days before go live, when we start training people, they'll, they'll get it and they'll just sort of accept yeah. it. And the reality is oftentimes that's when they first freak out and realize what the changes are because they're hearing about it for the first time in this big classroom training session or whatever. And so we have to figure out ways to get to sort of accelerate that process, get that happening sooner mm -hmm. in the project. So they're not freaking out right before we go live, which is going to create a lot of disruption. We're here with Brad Feeks talking about the people side of change and change management within cloud software migrations. We've got a lot more to cover. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back with more Transformation Ground Control. When I wake up, well, I know I'm going to be, I'm going to be the man who wakes up next to you. When I go out. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos and other best practices at thirdstageconsulting.com. Welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 151. My name is Eric Kimberling, here with Kyler Cheatham. You can find past episodes and new episodes of this show at transformationgroundcontrol.com. So be sure to check out that website, bookmark it, and uh, keep it locked in so you can see any new episodes that we publish each week. And uh, again, that's transformationgroundcontrol.com. We're here with Brad Feeks from Estes Group talking about change management in cloud software migrations. We've got a lot more to cover, so let's jump back into the conversation. No, oh, that's a great point. Testing is really a great form of training, I think yeah. you're saying, is that if you yeah. can get people involved in the testing process, unit testing, cross-functional testing, the broader uh, team you can get into there, the more people you'll already have ramped up. So the training is more of a rubber stamp than it is a, a, a screenshot. Yeah. Yeah. And here's a follow-up comment that's, that's a great one from Jill on LinkedIn. Jill says, I find the most effective training design is when the focus is around the process versus only tool functionality. When we focus on the behavioral changes directly, things tend to click faster. And that's really, I think that's perfectly said. That's a, a great point where I think, you know, as a software vendor, if I'm a software vendor, I'm going to focus my training on getting you to understand how my software works. But if I'm a team member of an organization trying to get my, my team members on board, yes, they need to know how the software works, but what's even more important is how, what does it mean for me? Like, what's my job? What's my process? How's my behavior need to change? Yeah, show me the tool too, of course, but that's only one dimension of it. So you have to sort of take the mindset of what the software vendors have and you have to broaden it to say, well, what's important to us is to train and to get people on board with broader behavioral and process changes, not just using a new tool. Right. This was another term that came back from the bond days that a, a colleague of mine used to use. The term was monkey button pushers, right? You can get a monkey to push a button, but you don't necessarily can convince him or get him to understand what happens when you button or why you should put the push that button and when you have a team of just button pushers who don't understand and you know, what from a process standpoint is this doing it's so much harder i think to try to get them to follow a sequence of events um, again going back to say an mes example where you're completing quantities on the shop floor well I'm, I'm clicking here and i'm clicking there and i'm clicking there and i'm putting a number in there if if that doesn't 
if you're not able to portray the why of this, well, when you do this, now that you've completed quantities, now we know that this much is in inventory. Now purchasing knows that they need to buy some new material. The, the extent of this is how this integrates to the full process. They say uh, when you showing them the what versus the why, why is kind of the, the statement of respect, right? I, I respect you enough to tell you the why in the background to understand how you can impact the overall business process. I think that comment there about process versus functionality is right on. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And then a follow-up comment from Jill again on LinkedIn. Hope is not a strategy. So that's a great, great. Tell uh, that follow. to Obama. Never mind. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, he built a whole presidency on, on uh, hope being a strategy. It was a campaign strategy. I'll say that much. It was. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Good marketing. Great marketing. Um, here's a question. There's a question I wanted to get back to here, which is a, was a few minutes ago. It came in. Um, bear with me. So here's an interesting question that's not going to show on the screen. So I'm gonna have to hide it to read the whole thing. But uh, it says, how, in your opinion, this is from Wichter on LinkedIn, Wichter says, how, in your opinion, will cognitive cloud computing affect businesses? Do you agree that this approach would dramatically change how companies operate? And how is it relevant to cloud ERP? Maybe I'll just stop there and sort of simplify the question a bit. Do you, so mm -hmm. are, are you oh, that's an interesting. Um, I, I've, I've played on the fringes of it. Um, in, my, in my mind, the idea of where some of the, the work is being done on automation and AI would be the, the replication of user interaction. Um, that is an area I think I've seen with many customers who are struggling with employee and staffing challenges, especially like during the pandemic last four years. Gosh, we're talking in fours now. Anyways, uh, you talk about people struggling to find the right bodies to do things like enter orders, schedule jobs. You have a lot of attrition and, and the younger crowd for whatever reason is not saying when I, when I wake up in the morning, I want to be an order entry clerk. So what do you do with order entry positions that now need to be done? You need to get your orders in. And there's a lot of customer specific tribal knowledge and such that needs to be handled. I think that's a place where uh, working with the ERP system and working with the process that intervenes it and you know, intercepting or receiving an input via the email or what have you, processing that data according to some heuristic methods, you know, discerning the the tribal knowledge and the the what ifs and the maybes and trying to you know calculate probabilities of what this means and what that means, then converting that into an entered order and replicating end user steps. You know, RPA is a nice way of doing that, saying okay, these are all the steps that a user goes through at a user interface level um, to replicate that work there. I think there's certainly a place there where those kind of plug and play positions uh, find themselves in the future being addressed. I see the same thing probably in purchasing. It has the the comparative least amount of tribal knowledge. I'm sorry if I'm offending any purchasers out there um, compared to some some other areas that are much more engineering and bill material specific. You, you talk about purchasing folks taking minim inventory minimums and work in process and stuff that's in transit and coming up with a, you know, order amount for a given purchaser understanding what the the purchasers or the vendors necessary limits are to hit price points and such taking all those inputs and generating an output of a purchase order i think that's a place where uh, ai and cognitive based systems could find themselves in the near future replacing positions that we have a hard time staffing for right now mm. yeah yeah absolutely. and I, I, would, I would say cloud Really, so the question of what is what does that do to cloud? You know, cloud's all about portability. You know, one of the big benefits to companies about cloud versions versus their on-premise uh, desktop client counterparts is the portability allotted to it. That if you have a system that is not bound and not limited in its interactions, you might find the ability there. Now it's those connections are that much easier to make. Um, versus you know that there to be working on this computer in this seat with this. Uh, network connection, a lot of those limitations now go away and allow for some of these other interactions to to happen unfettered, which is a good and bad thing. We can talk about that too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Here's a comment, <clears throat> uh, some kind words from LinkedIn. This has hit on so many variables I've encountered firsthand. Awesome discussion. So thank you for, for that comment. And again, Super. unfortunately, I can't see who, who that is exactly that said that, but thank you for the, the kind words to whoever you are. Um, I guess just to bring this all full circle, Brad, I'm, I'm curious, you know, we've covered a lot of ground here in terms of, 
first of all, the difference in the nuances between cloud and SaaS deployments versus on-prem versus the old, you know, the historic way of doing things. Um, we've also talked about the the change resistance as it relates to to cloud and web UI and, and stuff like that. So there's a lot we've covered here, but how do we get started in terms of if I'm a project team and I'm about to begin a cloud migration, what are some of the top recommendations you would give, you know, as far as here's how to, here are the things you want to do, or here are the things you want to make sure you focus on to get started on your, on your cloud migration? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, I will say it's a lot like physical training. Um, I did a lot of physical training where I would um, do exercises that weren't trying to achieve the goal. And then I ran into some folks on YouTube who would criticize folks who are doing plyometrics when they're trying to build muscle, right? Plyometrics are for building strength and explosiveness. They won't build muscle. So if you want to build muscle, get those plyometric exercises out there. Stop running for three hours. You need to be doing, you know, deep squats with a heavy bar on your back. Obscene work. I don't know why people do this. But anyways, it's, I think it's the same thing in an ERP is what goals are you trying to achieve? What problems are you trying to solve? If you don't have a clear idea of that, you're going to have a hard time implementing or you're going to implement something that solved different problems, right? You know, this ERP was a great solution to problems we didn't have. That's a problem. You know, you don't want to be in that position. So clearly understanding what your goals are as an organization, what the things are you're trying to achieve and what things are you trying to avoid is really important, whether it's, you know, web UI or whether it's cloud, whether you're going down, you know, do you have reason to stay on premise? Uh, there are plenty of reasons there. I, I see customers with poor bandwidth. If you're in a poor bandwidth zone, on premise is an entirely logical system. If you inherited uh, six month old hardware that has a five year warranty and it's stuck in a colo right now and that colo is reliable and secure, you're probably good for the next five years. You don't need to necessarily, you know, knee jerk react and jump to the cloud. So understanding your circumstance and your goals is probably the first step to any of these uh, sorts of, of situations. I'd say, you know, specifically speaking to the web UI and software migration. I think you really want to be asking that question. What are the benefits of staying current? Um, do I have risks? You know, what is the cost of doing nothing? This goes back to Six Sigma days. We always used to ask that question. You know, you run into a process. Well, what's the cost of doing nothing at all and just living with what we have? Is that cost significant or is it small? Can we can we scoot along for a while? Do those costs, costs kind of exponentially grow? Does that risk exponentially grow? Understanding all those pieces before you've been on a direction, I find to be really your your best bet to avoiding uh, future challenges down the road. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think it's a sound advice as far as how to how to get started and ultimately how to overcome some of the resistance to change that organizations inevitably experience in these these sorts of situations. So. All right. Thank you, Brad. Thanks for being here today. Great uh, conversation. Covered a lot of ground. And as always, time flew by. Uh, it always does tend to fly by when, when Brad's on the show. So thank you for being here today. Uh, we've got a lot more to cover. We're going to get to our, uh, we're going to debrief some of these points here that we just chatted about with Brad. We're also going to get to our top five interviews of 2023 here in, in a few minutes. So be sure to stick around for that. But first, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with more Transformation Ground Control. Hi, this is Eric Kimberling with Third Stage Consulting and your host of Transformation Ground Control. I want to encourage you to read our Guide to Organizational Change Management. It's a free report or a free guide that we published. It's one that I actually wrote that talks about best practices and lessons learned as it relates to change management. So as you know, on this podcast, we cover a lot of stuff related to the human sides of change, you know, organizational change management, including training, communications, org design, all kinds of stuff as it relates to change management. So if you're trying to learn more about change management, or you're looking for more direction and ideas on how to get started on your change management strategy and your overall journey, be sure to check out this guide. You can read it by scanning the QR code on the screen in front of you, or in the links below for this particular podcast episode, you can find a link to uh, take you to the page that'll allow you to register to go ahead and download that and read it for free. So be sure to check it out. It's the guide to organizational change management uh, written by yours truly. I hope you enjoy it. Let me know what you think and hope you enjoy the rest of this episode. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 151. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Kyler Cheatham. 
You can find new episodes of the show every Wednesday at transformationgroundcontrol.com. So be sure to check it out there. So Kyler, we just had Brad on the show talking about change management in cloud migrations. Those are two combined topics that we've talked about individually, separately, but never together. How, how change management affects or is affected by cloud migrations on the software side. But what were some of your observations or thoughts from that conversation with Brad? Absolutely. Well, great interview um, to you both. And then also amazing audience questions, um, the interaction there and kind of the sharing of ideas. That's a really beautiful thing to be able to see because that's you know how we create learning through these conversations. So thank you for that engagement. I think on on that side, it's always interesting to to talk to Brad because he has such a I mean, not only is he the king of analogies just in general, which were my one of my favorite things about him. But he also has a great way of kind of simplifying the steps in, in needing to look at kind of what are all of your other options or what's best for you as a business um, in that approach. So I, I think it's great to see you both kind of have that conversation around like what are the strategy basics and then what does it really look like for your business in creating these new kind of migration strategies, upgrade strategies, implementation strategies, whatever you need to call them. Um, but I think specifically, the one piece that I, I think is so important is really digging into, as he says, the hygiene or understanding of the organization when it comes to kind of the end user's experience um, and what that looks like. And you do a lot of that through not only end user pulling, but I assume organizational assessments can be a, a big part of understanding that hygiene um, for the business and the overall readiness of the organization to undergo either an upgrade or a new implementation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You, you know, doing those organizational readiness assessments to determine what the tailored targeted change strategy is, is really important because you don't want to take a one size fits all shotgun scattershot approach where you just start doing a bunch of change management stuff because it's part of the pro side methodology or whatever. That's all, you know, it's part of your toolbox. Of course, you want to pull the, the tools as needed, but you don't want to try everything. You want to focus on the things that are going to have the most impact to the organization. So yeah, doing that org rating assessment up front is one of the best ways to do that. Absolutely. Um, and a lot of that information, if you do kind of want to follow along, because I know that was a technical conversation as well as a very important strategic conversation, is available in our OCM um, guide, our secret sauce to organizational change management guide. Um, so we will pop that up too if you want to kind of follow along and download. Um, but highly recommend following Brad for amazing thought leadership. Um, that's a rewatcher, as I always call it. To kind of pull out um, additional nuggets. And then also, where is cloud heading in general? There was a lot of great trending conversation around kind of what is new emerging technologies that organizations should be prepared for. So thank you for providing that conversation. And thank you to Brad from Estix Group for joining us. Yeah, absolutely. It's great to have him on the show again. I'm sure it's not the last time we'll have him. So uh, thank, thank you to Brad and to the audience for the great questions there. Well, good. Well, we're going to shift gears now and uh, do sort of our capstone top five countdown of the top five interviews of 2023 as picked by you, Kyler. So, um, and actually I know what these top five are because, you know, we talked about them ahead of time and uh, you and I are very much aligned on what at least three or four of the top five are. I might swap out a couple of, of others, but I, I think these are, uh, you've definitely hit the ones, the, the top three that I thought were the three best and then number four and five uh, are very good as well. Um, but we're going to get to that top five countdown in here in just a moment. We're going to run through some clips from the top, interviews and some of the high points of this podcast throughout 2023, just as a way to look back on on last year and, and uh, see what you you may have missed. And we'll also point you to the podcast episode where you can see the full interview if, if uh, you want to watch the whole clip. So we're going to do that here. We're going to count down the top five interviews of 2023 from this podcast. We're going to do that here in just a moment. But first, we're going to take a quick break. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. Could you whisper in my ear the things you want to feel? I'll give you anything. Interested in working for a company that truly values your unique skills and experience? Here at Third Stage, we don't hire based on resumes alone. We look at the full candidate, experience, and willingness to provide excellent service for our clients. Within a technology independent and agnostic consulting firm, you have the opportunity to learn across industries with a diverse group of clients. Our consultants also have the opportunity to diversify their portfolio and learn across technology systems. If you're interested in joining a high growth entrepreneurial organization, please reach out to us at work at thirdstage-consulting.com. So 
thank you, Eric. I'm so excited to share with you my favorite interviews from 2023. And we are going to play clips of these. So just as a reminder, if you want to get the full interview, head over to transformationgroundcontrol.com and you can um, you can actually look at the full interviews because they're, they're packed full of great different um, pieces. So with that, um, let's kind of jump into it. So the one I'm going to start with is actually from um, Eric and Adrian Girdler. They talk talk about how to become a better project manager. And this is actually episode um, 130. So it premiered in July of 2023. And I think there's just great, really basic, actionable insights that you can take from this clip. So with that, I will play it for you. So I guess when you think back, so you, you've been doing this 25 years, you think back to when you first stumbled in accidentally into project management. Are there a couple key nuggets of things that you really wish you knew back then that you, you know now? If you could go back and do it all over, you might do it a little bit differently or, or you know, upskill a little bit faster in a couple of key areas. Yeah. You know what? I would have really learned facilitation first. Uh, I don't think people recognize that when you're a project manager, your secondary role is a facilitator. And there's two types of facilitation that you do. There's meeting facilitation. So you got to be really good at meetings. Why? Guess what? Most of your projects are all about meetings. Like that's how you execute on projects. Now it's not a meeting of an update. It's a meeting on, okay, what are resolutions? Where this, you know, where, where are we from a perspective of what's going on? How we come up? Is there an approval, et cetera? So you have to really learn how to control meetings because I don't know about some of you, it's really easy for some meetings to get out of control. And then all of a sudden you're spending a couple of meetings to address an issue that if you just understood how to facilitate a meeting well and establish those rules and boundaries, which you can do immediately at the beginning of a meeting to really nip anyone who's trying to, you know, has a hidden agenda and wants to take the agenda off track. You can kind of like nip those things in the bud and keep things on track. That's your job. Secondary thing is you are a brainstorming facilitator and that's very specific. So, you know, I think that's something that, you know, again, in my earlier years, I really thought, oh, I, you know, here I got a project. I did all the necessary documentation. I have my I didn't realize it was a baseline. Here's my project plan. Let's execute it and we're done. And it's like, right. no, that is your baseline project plan. Baseline. Baseline means it will change. Baseline means as of today with the information I have and all the due diligence I've done in advance of, I now have this baseline of what I think is going to have happen. As we start to execute, things pop up on the surface and we realize, oh my goodness, we can't do this. We can't do that. We have to change this. There's a supply chain issue. So I can't bring that in time. I got to shift schedules or I got to change direction or whatever it may be in order to keep my scope, time and budget. So that, that becomes really interesting. And that's where you have to, and this, this is where I think a lot of project managers, they don't do it. It's your job as a project manager to fill in the gaps and make sure the strategy of the organization and ultimately your project comes to fruition from a strategic standpoint. It is not your subject matter experts are great at executing tactically and they will do it. But you need to bring in the overarching umbrella of strategy and you have to help facilitate sessions. So there are times like, for example, for digital transformation, what's the biggest disconnect is between the business requirements and software engineers who are developing and designing. And a lot of times what the software engineers will say, and I get their perspective is like, hey, business, tell me what I need. And the business is like, well, I freaking know nothing about software. I don't know what I need. Help me out. Tell me what I need. And so what happens is business thinks they give what they need. Digital software is like, oh, great. I'm just going to build to what you tell me to build. And then all of a sudden the business is like, whoa, wait a minute. I need more than that. Didn't you think about it? Help me out. So there's this, there's this disconnect because a business really doesn't know what they need. They have ideas and concept. It's supposed to be this collaborative framework. So as a project manager, you have to go in and you have to brainstorm these sessions. You have to brainstorm these requirements. You know, you have to help both sides of the group to make sure that everything is really being looked at. That is what happens in really good projects. And then you do that throughout the life cycle of the project because there may be other things that pop up that you have to brainstorm brainstorm solutions for. So learning how to facilitate, oh my goodness, freaking huge. Sorry, I shouldn't, that's yeah. like my swear word, which I would actually, I swear a lot more than that. But anyway, I was gonna say, I'm, that's your, that's, I'm, I'm, that's my version. clean, that's my PG version. <laughs> no, that's funny. Well, you know, you're, you're touching on though uh, a couple of things. One is that, you know, you, you can be a project manager and check all the things on your on your checklist and hit all your milestones. And on paper, you could have a quote unquote successful project. Mm -hmm. But if you don't do the things you just described, a couple of things you described, you described facilitation. And then a moment ago, you described sort of getting the buy-in of the organization. 
those are two art, you know, it's more of the art of project management versus the science of project management, which is a topic I'm really fascinated by, because I think a lot of project managers tend to focus on the science yeah. of project management. Did I hit a milestone? Did I complete a task? Yes or no. But they don't necessarily understand the shades of gray of, yeah, we completed this milestone, but we didn't do it very well, or Absolutely. we didn't do it well yeah. enough to really say that we can declare victory. And, and knowing that is like, how do you do that as a project manager? You know what I mean? Like, as far as knowing that, yeah, technically we completed this task, but we really didn't. So that's experience, right? And then when you said to me, what do I, what do I wish I knew back when that I know now? And that would be to be, to understand more about team dynamics, because mm -hmm. I, again, like where I am today, believe you me, is a lot of trial and error, a lot of trial and error. So, you know, why now when I go into projects, I really am succinct. I can go very quickly. I can organize. In fact, people tell me I make it look easy all the time. I'm like, okay, just recognize I have over 25 plus years of experience doing this. Right. So I see patterns. That's my engineering mind. So I've seen patterns. So I know what to put in place for these patterns. I've seen this stuff. It just so happens to have a different you know, deliverable. It just happens to have different departments, but I promise you the patterns are still there. So if I understood a little bit more of team dynamics psychology, which by the way, I love, I actually read now a lot of, a lot of, a lot of psychology because again, I could have the perfect framework, all the right documents, but if I still have a team member who's not delivering again, project managers, no one reports into you. Nobody reports into you yet. You have to report into all these steering committees, senior executives, and ensure things are getting right. So, how do you motivate people who have other activities on their plate as well, not 100% of your project? And how do you get them motivated? And so, that's where I would really talk to the psychology, the understanding, emotional intelligence, picking up on cues. I've gotten more information through body language than I do through vocally. And, and it's something where with virtual meetings and global teams, it's sometimes difficult when everyone has their camera off. Right. Right. So That's good. Yeah. So little things like that, like turn little, your camera on. Yeah. And again, there's people who are like, no. Yes. I don't have to. It's my choice. My background is messy. I'm like, right. well, you know, and it's an interesting dilemma for organizations because I do give people choice. I explain why I'm asking. So that's probably the big thing is I do a lot of whys. Here's why we're doing it. Here's mm -hmm. why I'm asking you to do this. And then people kind of get, it. I go, look, I get more information from you with your camera on. I can see whether you're agreeing with me or disagreeing with me, but I'm letting you know for all the cameras off and everyone's going, yes, Adriana, yes, Adriana, yes, Adriana. Then I know there's some of you who have no clue what you're saying yes to. Like, I, I, I know that because I then have to do these extra meetings after the fact. And I'm like, seriously, I'm an efficiency person. Like right. that's a waste. We deem that a waste in the system. <laughs> right. Well, and now you're, way. it's yeah. Like now I have to do, oh, seriously. So, you know, for smaller core teams, great. I find the larger teams, there's a little more challenge with it. And I, I, I feel for organizations because, you know, in all honesty, when you're in the office, do you like hide in the corner and turn your back to everyone because you don't want to show your face when you're around a boardroom table for a meeting? Do you do that? Yeah, no. No, <laughs> yeah. no. So why is that acceptable virtually? Right. It's still a meeting. It's just that it's a tool in the technology we're using. It's it's fascinating. If you're if you're doing work in a meeting, then you shouldn't be at that meeting. Right. Well, I was just gonna say I think <laughs> that's why I mean? people are multitasking, yeah. so that's why they yeah. don't want to be on camera necessarily. Yeah. Um, well, and and if that's the case, be honest and you know say to the facilitator, which is why I talk about facilitation. You have to know who to invite, what exactly you're doing, what's your agenda, because if people know that your meetings are productive and have a purpose, they will join and they will turn the camera on and they will do what they need to do. If they feel it's just the same old, same old, like a status update meeting, or we're just going through the motions of stuff, then they won't, they won't turn it on. So there's something where you have to look to yourself and say, how much am I contributing to this issue as well? So, you know, I always say, um, as, as I said earlier on, you know, always put your best foot forward, do the best job you can for the day. But on the flip side of that as well, you have to always ask yourself too, am I part of creating what the issue is right now? Let's say with like meetings and everyone having their camera off, right? Is it a right. culture thing? Is it, you know, is it just people on my team? Do I have to have some one-on-ones? And this would probably be going back to your original question. I wish when I was younger, I had the courage and knew how to properly 
address challenges. Because I think there was a part of me that would ignore challenges. And I see that a lot in the younger generation is they don't know how to address challenges. And instead of addressing them and learning it, because it's a skill set, a very powerful skill set for all relationships, professional relationships, personal relationships, they walk away. Hmm right? They walk yeah. away or they don't address it. So it's, it's very, it's very interesting. So, you know, again, that's that whole psychology, how, you know, how can I properly respectfully and professionally, Eric, challenge you and, and address a difficult situation because you're not delivering. That's not right. easy to do when you're young and you have someone who's older than you, who's a subject matter expert on your team. Right. Right. So, but there's a way to go about doing it. Yeah. Way to go about doing it. All right, great interview. I'm curious to see what's next and what the next uh, one on your list is going to be. Kyler, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll look at the rest of our top five interviews for 2023. We'll be right back with more Transformation Ground Control. Well, we're living in, let me tell you. I'm excited to share our newly released 2024 Digital Enterprise Operations Report. This free download is available on the Third Stage website at thirdstage-consulting.com. This report is truly packed full of technology independent and agnostic insights for your project to ensure that you're strategically optimized for success. Download your copy today with the QR code in front of me or visit our website for more details. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 151. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Guy the Cheatham. You can find new episodes of this show every Wednesday at transformationgroundcontrol.com. So be sure to check out that website to keep up with all the new episodes and past episodes you may have missed. So we're going to do, and we are doing our top five countdowns of the top five interviews of 2023 so far. So Kyler, what's next on the list? So let's go back to kind of digging into one of my favorite episodes. It's called Digital Strategy Theory Versus Reality. And as many of you know, I really enjoy when we have our higher education folks on here um, to kind of talk about the theories behind digital transformation. But this interview is specific, is not only with our own PhD, Dr. Scott Jenke and Eric, but it takes not only the theory that's actually taught in the classroom, but showcases and compares it with the reality of what it looks like through digital transformation. So this is episode number 115 from earlier in 2023 and is with Scott Janke and Eric. So let me roll you that clip. Melissa on LinkedIn says the people involved in, in the digital transformation don't always have the level of expertise or sometimes attitude um, they need to have. Um, it sort of raises a question in my mind, which first of all, I agree with you, Melissa. I, I agree that... Um, you know, people involved in transformation don't always have the right expertise or the attitudes. But I guess that begs a question of what are some of those intangible attitudes or maybe just broadening a little bit intangible skills that a digital transformation team needs to have that isn't necessarily something you learn in textbooks or that you learn in the world of academia or even a, a certification program or whatever. What are, what are some of those soft skills? You know, I, I was, I don't know where I heard this before, but I, I think um, both being inquisitive uh, which is something that I've had and why I, I sought out a, a doctorate, you know, halfway, more than halfway through my career. Uh, but also this kind of servant mentality. Mm. Um, we find project teams that maybe a couple of consulting uh, uh, FTEs, uh, full-time equivalent kind of people, uh, and let's say six company employees as part of a, a certain work stream. They, they typically have this attitude and I don't necessarily know why, maybe it's just a, a leadership perspective for, for that they've had for a couple of decades, but they want to stay in their lane. Mm. They, they, I am, I am accounting and this is, I'm only going to think about accounting. I'm, I'm supply chain. This is the only thing I want to know and not having that servant slash inquisitive kind of perspective. And again, Formal education isn't any determination of whether you're smart or not. So I'm assuming most folks that have been hired by our clients are smart people. Right. But they just seem to have both either a, a direction by their supervisor or it's just their nature by itself is that they never really figure out where things fit together hmm. and, and why a different group is doing something in this area. And not even asking that question even prior to the project is, is troublesome because you know that's going to be a challenge of you and the organization throughout the implementation or other activities that, that the organization is doing. 
to, to make people care that there's a full stream here. Um, I, I tell this to, to new clients. One of the things that we do typically in the first couple of weeks of a project, um, and this is, this is even outside of third stage, all my consulting uh, engagements in the past. After a kickoff, we do kind of a workshop and we bring people from different disciplines within the, in the, in the organization together. And it never, never fails to surprise me when people talk about these end to end processes of, I have a purchasing need. How does it come into a warehouse? How does it get assigned to a, a job and how does it get leave the warehouse or go to the client? People learn things that have been working there for decades. Hmm. They, they realize that some work they're doing that they think somebody downstream is using isn't being used or some process has already been fixed and they thought it was broken still today. So it's, it's, it's disappointing, but it's encouraging at the same time that even on these projects, people are learning how the, the picture works together. And I think right. that's one thing that, that can be instilled in an organization way before any kind of massive project gets started is to have some of those thought processes. We routinely ask for a, a litany of, of documents, process flows, work, job descriptions, all these things. It is amazing to me how many large companies don't have anything documented about how the picture looks. Right. Because people just get hired, they work in their group and that's how it is. And, and it's, it's really interesting that it, it takes a, a big project for them to start thinking and building out a process uh, by department, by end to end, when people start kind of realizing why the project is starting in the first place, because they have lots of disconnects uh, or why this is going to make you more competitive advantage in your marketplace versus just being as is. So just that right. inquisitive kind of servant mentality of, of roll up your sleeves and get get your hands dirty, I think is a, a great sign of of the culture of an organization. Yeah, absolutely. And overcoming that tribal knowledge and and um collectively or consolidating that tribal knowledge, documenting it, making it more of a um a formalized process. I think that's something that you can, you touched on too, which uh is one of the benefits of going through a digital transformation. Even if you you rely on tribal knowledge now. Um, or especially if you rely on tribal knowledge, now it's even more important to document your processes and define yep. what that future state yep. is very clearly for, for certain, which again, runs a little bit counter to agile approaches. Agile yep. would suggest, well, let's not worry about documenting future state. Let's just build something, get it out there, test it, let people respond to it. Then we'll tweak it however we need to. And that's, you know, so those are two different approaches that, that are in conflict oftentimes. Um, yeah, and I'll even make a, a bold statement and say that a, a full um, uh, agile project to implement an enterprise solution will not and will never work. Hmm. Um, there is just it's too big, too expensive, lots of moving parts uh, for it to clearly have these approvals throughout the process, these stage gates, as well as, to your point, the formal documentation. Uh, yeah. You forego that and then Five years later, you want to do an enhancement to it or, or bolt something onto it. And, and all you have to do is rely on how the system's operating today as your only source of how it was built. Um, you're going to be, you're going to be kind of guessing of how to move forward. Right. So, yeah. Absolutely. Something else you mentioned too, is you talked about, I'll paraphrase what you said, but you talked about the uh, specialization of consultants and, and uh, disciplinary functions. Like uh, when you look at a digital transformation, there's all these different areas of specialization that you need to bring to the table. You have, uh, you need uh, project managers, you need change managers, you need functional consultants, technical consultants, you need process type people, um, obviously developers and people that can do the, the hands-on configuration. All that stuff requires a bit of specialization, but to your point, it pulling together all those pieces into a cohesive strategy and, and looking at the entire big picture. That's, to me, I agree with what you said there. I think that's one of the biggest things that are missing from digital transformations. And one of the biggest reasons why transformations fails because you don't have that big picture view of how it all ties together. And when we look at our um, digital strategy framework, the, the framework that we use in helping our clients define their digital strategies, it's, it's designed to pull together all of those pieces as well as our implementation methodology too. But I think the problem is, is you know, organization doesn't have the skill set or the expertise to do a transformation on their own, which is very common and understandable. So they end up hiring consultants and system integrators to come in and do it for them. But no one oftentimes is looking at that big picture of how it all ties together. How is this aligned with our corporate strategy? Where there is a misalignment? What are we going to do about it? And just working through 
all those different pieces, it, it seems to be something that's commonly missing in, in these sorts of projects. Yeah, you, you, you hit upon something that I was going to mention if you didn't, uh, is, is, you know, organizations routinely revisit their mission statement, their strategy, their goal, core uh, beliefs uh, on a regular basis. Obviously, if you're a public company, uh, you're almost forced to do that on at least annually with an annual report. Uh, but I think they still look at improvements to their operations as just projects. Mm. Uh, and they don't sit there and align all the activities that are part of our framework around change management process enhancements, um, uh, architectural landscape, uh, true formal PMO guidance, along with what the business leaders are doing from a strategy perspective and market penetration and all that kind of stuff. They, they kind of say, I want to go in this direction. Oh, I need this tool. So they go after the tool, but they don't kind of bring it back again of, are you achieving what you wanted to from a business perspective? Um, I think right. very few technology deployments are truly just an IT function, right? Everything that gets introduced to an organization is a business application. Um, right. And I think a lot of the, the newer, younger CIOs are really grabbing hold of that, uh, but it hasn't filtered down. Uh, right. And it becomes, well, finance is fighting with the IT group for something, right? Uh, with, and it's, if it's a small thing, I understand that. But if it's a kind of a function of this transformation and the strategy going forward, that needs to become much more of like, how can I help you? How can I help you? Versus, well, that's a different budget. Go get money somewhere else kind of thing. And they've lost the fact that you're not in sync as an organization from an IT perspective and a business operations perspective. Right. Yeah. Makes, makes perfect sense. So thank you, Scott. Thank you, Eric. Um, that's a great clip to actually go into and follow along from the full episode. So that is episode, as a reminder, number 115. Another episode that was earlier in this year that I think is a great piece to kind of bring back in closing 2023 and opening 2024 is episode number 107. And this is career in consulting. And Eric actually asked some of his colleagues here at Third Stage that are some of our most tenured consultants that have some of the the most diverse experience, not only in working for vendors, system integrators, and he talked to them about careers in consulting, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So with that, this is a great conversation to follow along. It's episode number 107. Why did you, why did you choose a career in consulting? What is it that it, uh, appealed to you when you, when you chose this career? I think the thing that, that most appealed to me and, and 20 years ago and still today is the ability to work with the, the various different individuals, different organizations, different industries, and different size of firms as well. We we here at Third Stage and throughout my career, I've been lucky enough to work with some Fortune 50 companies, have also worked with some really good startup companies here over the last few years where we have five to 10 employees and we're just helping them along their path. So I think for me, first and foremost, it's the variety of people, industries, and size of the clients. Yeah, that's great. How about how about you, Scott or Adam? What are some of the reasons why you guys uh, why did you guys choose the career? Much the same, but I'll, I'll be even more selfish. Is I love to eat and travel, and so uh, <laughs> uh, consulting uh, offers you a lot of variety, and that's kind of what uh, drove me to continue being in, in consulting. I have left a couple of times and taken on a, a senior level operational role, but uh, I just missed the opportunity to be challenged, and that's really, uh, the flexibility of of all the clients you get to work with is pretty exciting. Yeah. Yeah. I might come back to that point about industry versus consulting and get, you get some of your perspectives on the differences there, especially for those listening in that maybe are in industry or they've got another profession that they're in, but they're thinking about or interested in moving to uh, the consulting space. Yeah. Um, and then Adam, last but not least, what are your thoughts? Why, why did you choose consulting? Yeah. So um, I, um, like Scott said, the, the variety of it is a, is a key part of it. I'm somebody that, like, if you put me in a repetitive role, um, I will just suffer <laughs> and yeah. not be happy at all. I need um, I need that type of simulation. And I was actually working at um, a large telecommunications company in the Denver area um, when I got a call from a consulting firm run by Eric Kimberling and that said, we have a new client in New Zealand. Would you like to go? Um, <laughs> and I said, well, let me think real hard about that. <laughs> Uh, we need you there on Monday. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. So um, that was kind of a, a lead in that um, I needed to, to get into the industry and really haven't looked 
while I have looked back once, I did go back to the um, a more operational role for a little while and just really miss the consulting side of things. It's it, um, it can be quite exhilarating. There's a lot of work to do, of course, but um, the mental stimulation and the challenges that, that come along with it are just, you can't beat them. And you get a lot of exposure to so many different types of people. The travel can be great. Um, and, you know, the food is always a good thing. You try things in different places. So uh, that's really kind of how I got into it and came into it, left and got bored um, and came back. And I just am so glad to be here. And uh, I made the decision to go back to consulting because it's um, really been a key component of uh, my life. That's for sure. Yeah, that's that's interesting to hear that perspective of kind of going back to industry and then realizing how much you miss it because I've, I've never done anything but consulting. And I always wonder, what would I do if I wasn't doing consulting? And I have no idea what I would do. Uh, and I can't imagine You'd be another so career. Bored. <laughs> I know I'd be really bored. I'd, I'd be a terrible employee. I probably wouldn't be happy. So <laughs> I'm sure there's something out there I might like besides consulting, but uh, there is a lot to like about sure. consulting that I can't imagine doing much else. Um, what about, what is it, and you started to get into this, Adam, but maybe we'll start with you on this next question, but what is it you like most about consulting? You mentioned the travel and the variety, you know, diverse experience, you're not bored. What are some of the other things you like most about being in consulting? Oh yeah. Just, you're always learning something new. I've been doing, like I said, I've been doing this for more than 10 years and, um, I'm still learning new things today and things that you would never believe, uh, happened. Like it, uh, never occurred to me that not everybody runs either a, a 52 week, or a 12 month uh, calendar year, you know, but in some industries um, it's, it's different. They run it differently. And I'm still learning to understand that financial aspect of it and the, and the key components of how you run a calendar year that isn't, um, you know, June 1st through May 31st or whatever it may be. Um, but that's fun. So there's always something new to learn. And the interactions with the people and the clients are just, you can't replace them. You get to meet so many different types of people, um, understand so much of a great holistic view of not just how one business works, but how the just the global economy works when you start to understand different industries and how they fit in together uh, and how they complement each other. It's absolutely fascinating. Um, you also get to develop some really great relationships with some Folks that you travel with and, and folks that you work with, whether they're clients or uh, uh, consultants along your side. And the partnerships are just, you can't beat them. You don't get that type of thing in any type of more traditional operational role. Yeah. Yeah. What are your thoughts, Scott? What, what is it you like most about consulting? Yeah, there's there's some repetition to, to consulting uh, for sure. You know, there are skill sets and, and processes uh, that are repeated from one client to the other, but, but it's never the same. Uh, and I think that one of the, the advantages of being a consultant versus somebody who has long tenure at a company is they don't know what other people do. And so you as a consultant are able to provide such a unique perspective. And I know Eric has a, a soft point uh, when we talk about best practices. Um, you could literally never take an exact process from another company and move it to another company. Industry is different, size of the company is different, the integrations and technology is different, the staff is different. So there's always gonna be some unique challenges for every client, even if you're doing the same project over and over again. Uh, it's always a different roadmap and, and a little bit to what um, uh, Adam mentioned is, I, I'm still amazed that I'm still learning stuff. It is it is such a unique thing to, to get into consulting and go to the same client after 10 years and they're doing things dramatically different and you have to get up to speed. And that that challenge or that uh, motivation to kind of get up to speed is what I really like about consulting. Um, yeah, yeah the, the, the fact that the clients uh, kind of treat you as a confidant uh, and kind of have a lot of hallway conversations and, and uh, conference rooms where they pull you to the side saying, tell me the truth, right? How's the team doing? How are the staff doing? Because we have the perspective that the, the clients usually don't. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great, great point. And, and you could, uh, what I always find fascinating is there's times where we'll come in and we'll make recommendations or observe things or provide insights that are in some way, in some cases, they're similar to what the employees internally are saying or are feeling. But the fact that you're an outside consultant, it's just viewed differently. It's got more credibility. And it's, it always amazes me that, um, you know, that, that, that perceived, um, the perceived value that comes from outside consultants is so much higher. Um, which can be flattering at times, but it's also 
just an interesting dynamic as well. Um, yeah, that's, that's great. What about, what about you, Nate? What are some of the things that uh, you like best about consulting that we haven't talked about? You know, I think just to add to what uh, what Adam and and Scott said, I I think it's I think it's interesting too the, that that um, you do have that that unique perspective, and we do a lot of um, a lot of d- digital transformation projects, and we deal with a lot of companies that have stalled in their uh, either an implementation or a transformation, and I think it's it's really interesting to to see the similarities. That companies, while Adam kind of referred to how different companies are, I think there's there's also it's also real interesting and and real rewarding to see that that everyone's going through similar challenges. Everyone has their own secret sauce and and uh, the, sorry for an overused phrase, but I think everyone in in within their company does a really good job with what they do uniquely. But but they're all facing some pretty similar challenges. So our ability to come in and say, you know, we've seen this, we've we've seen it a hundred times. We've seen uh, best practices. We've seen leading practices. Here's how we can give you a roadmap to get out of what your challenges are and to get through the the roadblocks that you're experiencing. Is is really not not only rewarding, but it but it's also fun to be able to to keep uh, taking those skills that we're learning from the from the client, um, mastering them more and implementing them with with new experiences. Yeah, yeah, well well said. What about on the flip side though? I'd be curious to hear why Nate. You know why? What is it you like least about consulting? Every career has a has a dark side or you know things that aren't as fun as other other jobs what, what is it you like least about consulting or what have you seen other consultants struggle with in the field of consulting you know i think for me the, the biggest challenge is is we we are there for just a short window of time so we will help a client um, from inception to go live uh, obviously we'd like to be involved in a in a, an organization after the system goes live and after they start to experience some of the advantages of implementing a new system but i think with me it's it's a little bit of that unfinished business it's it's mm-hmm. that you that you, you you don't have ownership from beginning to end eventually you have to leave a client and you um you know you move on to the next client so for me it's it's that it's that not you know not being able to to really see something through fruition for a year or two down the road yeah, that's a great point. You you build all these relationships and you become close to a client, and then you're you're gone, you know, because you you've completed whatever the project is, and and that can be, it's it's rewarding in some ways because you get to meet so many different people and so many different clients. But on the flip side, um, you you have to move on and you don't own it, you know, long longer term, which is uh, a good point. Excellent. Well, thank you to Eric and the rest of the team here at Third Stage, Nate, Adam, um, and Scott that helped us go through that conversation. Some great insight and career advice there. And again, to listen to that full conversation, I know it can be a lot in a panel discussion, so highly recommend going to episode number 107. All right. Great interview. I'm curious to see what's next and what the next uh, one on your list is going to be. Kyler, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll look at the rest of our top five interviews for 2023. We'll be right back with more Transformation Ground Control. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstage-consulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 151. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Kyla Cheatham. You can find new episodes of the show every Wednesday at transformationgroundcontrol.com. So be sure to check out that website to keep up with all the new episodes and past episodes you may have missed. So we're going to do, and we are doing our top five countdowns of the top five interviews of 2023 so far. So Kyler, what's next on the list? So my next clip here is actually one of my top three favorites. I really like this episode because it talks about 
how to actually actionably avoid failures through using your own tools within your organization. And this is from the onboard team, which is some of our partners here at Third Stage that Eric talks to about how ERP failures really link to poor employee adoption and training. This is episode number 119. Hope you enjoy this clip. What about limitations of generic off the shelf, out of the box training materials? I mean, most of these vendors like S4 HANA, you mentioned before Microsoft Dynamics, they've been around for years and they've had time to build up some a pretty good library of standard training materials. What are the limitations? I think this is a really important point because so many organizations, including a lot of our clients, just don't understand or don't fully recognize the fairly severe limitations of that standard off the shelf or out of the box training material or training content. How, what are the limitations of that? Or maybe give us some examples yeah. there. Sure. Um, yeah, there are considerable limitations and you are right. Some of the um, well-established software houses do have off the shelf training material, but there are limitations. And some of those are, they are typically functional in content and instruction. So what that means is it cannot address any of the business specific or business um, context messages to all audiences, it's impossible, right? Because you've got multiple sectors and multiple industries reading and referring to the same content. So it cannot be that specific to that audience. So that leaves the audience a tad disengaged and also asking the question, is this pertinent to me? Is this right for me? For example, if I'm looking at content that shows me how to raise a purchase order uh, to order steel from China, yet I'm in retail or pharma, that's not really going to help me that much. It's, you know, it's going to leave me confused. I need to understand and see and read language that pertinent to my business, my products, my customers, my suppliers, etc. Um, so illustrations and examples, they're all generic. And a significant percentage of a learner's understanding of this is not just by reading explanatory uh, content, it's by looking at screen illustrations. Those screen illustrations, which a lot of our um, online tools do, so Task Recorder, Click Learn, all of those types of automated online tools that are typically sold as the answer to everybody's training problem, reduce your cost by 70%, no additional external cost, they actually take screenshots of empty dialogue boxes. Now, surely you would want a value, a meaningful value or text description or business aligned content, because that's also going to contribute to our learners understanding as to how they would populate those screens. So I suppose I would say that the, the key word for me is it's not business process aligned. Um, it's very generic and it doesn't actually address the bespoke requirements. And more and more now we're actually coming across organizations who unfortunately have spent their training budget or managed their training budget based on the cost of one of these system line tools. So for example, we've come across um, Oracle Guided Learning recently, but also with Task Guides and Enable Now. And it really is sold as being the answer to everything. But we've discovered, for example, with Oracle Guided Learning recently, one of our clients needed seven languages translated. Um, but they've come back and been told that they can probably get French translated and it's 80% accurate. Now, for a client that's actually investing, you know, put a lot of their, their training budget and their, their trust in a tool like that, it needs to give them more than that. And as Eric quite rightly said, we've got a lot of these big software houses, so Oracle, for Oracle Fusion and S4 HANA and so on. They have libraries worth of generic content. But again, some of these online solutions are literally... They sell role-based training, but that role-based training is basically a whole combination of lots of different process guides that that poor end user who may, I'm not going to say as 400, show my age there, but maybe moving from a completely different environment and just reading content on screen, that's not going to cut it. They need a blended approach. They need maybe just that first, get them across that first hurdle and then they can start self-learning um, tools. But it's really, really important that you understand, I would say, that you know what you're buying and you know what you're getting if you are investing in any type of automated learning program. Do your research, do your homework. Yeah, great point. And and you know another thing you've you've alluded to in that response, Nikki, is the fact that um, so many of these ERP systems are are fairly flexible I and mean, they can do a lot of different things. And even the simplest workflow, like accounts payable, you mentioned there isn't really a standard accounts payable process that every organization is using, even for the same product. I mean, even for the same product, you're going to have variations of how that 
system yeah. was configured and, and also how you're going to not only interact with the system, but what are the things that happen outside the technology? Like what are the things that don't relate to that one technology? So often we get myopically focused on S4 HANA, Microsoft D365 or whatever the tool yeah. is that we don't think about, well, what do you do outside the system? Or what other systems are you touching? Do you need to touch to be able to do your job? And I imagine that's part of the training approach too that you would suggest. Yeah, it's such a valid point, Eric, because um, a lot of um, clients that we work with or, or deal with initially, they'll ask, oh, so you'll only train us in um, Dynamics 365 or just S4 HANA? No, we're we train in end user solutions. So if our end user touches D365 um, extensions and an external pricing um, or yeah pricing tool, all of those need to be addressed as part of that end user experience. Otherwise, we're not giving them their true role and how it will be used with that system. So, and that's the difference, I suppose, with um, SI training. It's very much, unless you're starting to look at integrations, it's very much under the bonnet looking at that ERP functionality and its modules. For us, we're looking at what holistically that end user needs and also not what they don't need. In other words, we've probably all been on courses at some stage in our lives where we've just been doing this. You know, counting the clouds because the content that's being trained out at that present moment in time is not relevant and then we miss a bit that is. So the idea behind that bespoke training is it's all got to be relevant for the end user and it will encompass any of those third party tools that you mentioned, Eric. Right. Yeah, great point. Mm -hmm. Just to turn to the audience here, some of the audience comments and question. Um, like on LinkedIn says, I'd, I'd speak about S4 HANA. It's true that most material is available for functional people but it lacks off the shelf material for business users, 100% correct. Yeah, so, right. you know, and it's, it, we have a client, actually we have one client that we're working with right now. They're actually implementing S4 HANA. They're about to go live here in, in a couple months. And they, they have been um, asking us like, why, why is it you have to custom create these training materials? These, this software has been around for years. I mean, there's tons of material available and that's, that's, I think the, you know, the disconnect oftentimes is the understanding of, yeah, there's a lot of, to your point, Nikki, there's a lot of materials available, but they're not specific to your business and you're deploying S4 HANA in a very different way than any other organization has. Um, even though they're not doing a ton of customization, it's still tailored, it's, yeah. it's configured differently. They use different third-party systems that bolt onto it, all that stuff, you know, you've got to work through. And those little things aren't so little, you know, when, you, when it comes to adoption and training and back to the original point of why products fail because of this, it's those little things that I don't know how to do in my job that creates sort of a domino breakdown in, our, in the end-to-end -end processes because I don't know how to do one part of the process. No one taught me how to do it or I just don't understand it well. And that ends up leading to a bunch of process breakdowns that can become yeah. pretty material. Yeah, and also in client meetings, the, the dreaded words we hear are, um, oh, it's just off the shelf, or it's just box. out of the box <laughs> functionality. <laughs> the they say that, well, the whole world's not using the same chart of accounts for starters. And then there's a whole melee of different areas. Even if it is out of the box with very limited customization, it's still the ERP system used by you, your customers, your suppliers, your product suite, your materials. So it, it still does need to have that bespoke element with regards to training because an off the shelf um, set of training materials doesn't cut it for most ERP implementations. Yeah, and I would I would argue too that the more business value you're trying to get out of your digital transformation or ERP implementation, the more important that employee adoption training is. Because let's just use an example of a multinational organization that's deploying Microsoft D365, mm -hmm. and they're using that as an opportunity to standardize business processes and sort of consolidate functions in different locations and move to a shared service model where now you've got consolidated HR, consolidated accounting and finance or whatever. Um, that's that's not just a software deployment, that's a material business transformation. There you're talking about changing people's jobs and how you operate. And so the, how do you build that sort of non-technology, but more process and organizational focus into training materials? Have you found that to be an important part of that customization of training? Yeah, it's absolutely critical. And one of the questions we typically ask quite early on is, does your, is it an ERP implementation? Or as you said, is it a business transformation program? Do you have a target operating model exercise ongoing? Does it finish before or after your implementation? Ideally before. But the key thing for us is to work with the subject matter experts to ask a whole series of questions that start with who, what, why, where, how. Um, so in other words, we're, we are supporting and we're there for the end users because 
they will be sat in front of an ERP solution about to raise their first sales order and say, where do I choose my customer? Why do I choose that product? Where do I adjust or apply the discount? And it's all of those typical questions that we would ask during the development of those training materials. And it's giving the business context behind why the user does it. So many um, standard training materials um, are literally just functional based. But when I pick something up, if I'm being told to press a series of buttons, especially if we're talking numbers here, I want to know why I'm doing that. So you've got to have that context. And also from a business um, rationale, you want to make sure that your end users, even at field level, are making informed, smart decisions and they're selecting the right values. And so that's what you're not going to get off the shelf. That's how we capture that business process information as well. And I suppose one of the other things that I would say is we utilize collateral at the outset and the start of your ERP, ERP engagement, because you're going to have objectives, mission statements, um, targets that you want to meet. And all of that needs to be encompassed and also packaged up as part of the training program. Your comms messages need to be peppered through the training program as well. So the whole thing needs to be joined up and the same messages are being heard by your end user community right from the get go to the last training session that's delivered or the last piece of self learning that's completed before you go live. So business process is key. Right. All right. Thank you to Eric and the onboard team for that clip. Again, episode number 119, a great piece to really learn how you can optimize your project through great um, user adoption, employee training. Highly recommend that. All right. Great interview. I'm curious to see what's next and what the next uh, one on your list is going to be. Kyler, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll look at the rest of our top five interviews for 2023. We'll be right back with more Transformation Raw Controls. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos and other best practices at thirdstageconsulting.com. Transformation Ground Control episode number 151. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Kai Cheatham. You can find new episodes of the show every Wednesday at transformationgroundcontrol.com. So be sure to check out that website to keep up with all the new episodes and past episodes you may have missed. So we're going to do, and we are doing our top five countdowns of the top five interviews of 2023 so far. So Kyler, what's next on the list? Last, but certainly not least, um, we need a drum roll sound over here. We have episode number 135 that talked about um, the good, the bad, and the ugly of IT conversations with someone who's been in the industry, um, our friend from Epicor, uh, Kristen Valentine. And this really goes into how the industry has evolved and what that looks like um, in going into our, our next five years um, and that scope. So again, that's episode number 135 with Kristen Valentine. And let's play that clip. Don't let bad processes drive the technology, though, and that's sort of what you're saying: is you know, don't don't take a bad process and an inefficient process, and then hope that your new technology can just automate that. You really oh. want to rethink how you how you approach your business, right? Or Gary, let me just say, don't put lipstick on a pig. Um, right. <laughs> you know, so yeah, you really do need to think about those processes and do they work? But also, too, that makes the point about this was a $60 million company should not have had, um, you know, I won't say which one of the ones, but the first couple that I always call out shouldn't have had it just too heavy a, a product for a $60 million company. Now that company wanted to go public. So of course they purchased, um, you know, it um, the software so that they could, you know, kind of create their profile for, you know, there to go get a much more effective, you know, um, offering. 
but you know, that was a little too ahead of the curve and the software was just too big and too heavy and they didn't have the infrastructure. But, you know, we also know too, and I think Gary makes a great point. We've all heard the story. I think Eric, if I tortured you with this, you know, please let me know, but you know, about the new bride who makes her, um, her husband, um, the celebratory meal of a roast and she immediately lops the end off. Right. You've heard this story. I have not, I have not, or if I have, I don't remember where, where we're going with it. So I'm curious well, to see. It makes, <laughs> it makes Gary's point in that the new, you know, and, and, you know, immediately the, the husband is, is quite distressed because he's, the end is his best, his favorite part. And I'll make this a lot. It's, you know, certainly I can, I can milk a joke, but this one for you guys, <laughs> I'll try to make it quick. The long and the short of it is, he, you know, great meal goes to the mother uh, in law and says, you know, I love, love your daughter. Great. It was so touched by this celebratory meal, but why does she lump, you know, lop the end off of the roast before she makes it? Oh, you don't understand. It came from my mother. It's handed on traditions. We always used it for, you know, holidays and big events. And it's a time honored tradition goes to the grandmother and says, you know, well, thank you very much. I love your daughter. It was great. But then goes to the grandmother and says, you know, great meal, loved it, etc. But I don't understand why you cut the end of the roast off when that's my favorite part. And the grandmother says, because my pants are too small. <laughs> <laughs> it's very fitting. I mean, it, it well, pardon that that was not an intentional pun, but it's, it's oh, yeah. for, nice <laughs> pun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but for this industry, that's very fitting. Uh, yeah, it needs to, uh, you, you don't want to force fit. Is, is that the lesson here? You don't want to force fit a, a process into, into technology and vice versa? Well, and also question, why are we doing these things this way? Just because you've always done them this way does not necessarily mean you should be doing them going forward. And it, it's not to say that, you know, you're contrarian, but I think it's really healthy to question um, and say, it, does this matter? Is this, you know, is it relevant? And also, you know, question your market. Um, if you have relationships with your customers to say, how does this fit? Is this working for you? But at the same time, also, you know, and many of us probably don't want to hear it, but also ask your, you know, your up and coming workforce. How did this feel? Does this make sense? Um, I had the wonderful uh, opportunity of calling on a contract manufacturer in in, um, uh, in Reno, which we know is a huge growth area. Mm -hmm. And every, the guy who did the scheduling came in at 4 a.m., posted the schedule. So when they came in at 7 all the workers gathered around the pole that it was taped on. This is true at seven, nine after lunch. And again, at two based on the deliveries that came in that day. Hmm. And you're thinking to yourself, just think about the time that's taking. Yes. Yes. The scheduling guy was brilliant. Yes. That is how the way they did it. But yes, also too, what should have taken, a, you know, mm, two to five minutes of what, where are my jobs and what can I work on was turning into two and a half hours of coffee clatching because everybody was gathering around and, and you look at like, mm, okay, yep, the schedule's good and everybody knows what they need to do, but are we getting, you know, are we getting the kind of productivity that allows us to take more jobs or to deliver jobs faster? Um, because we do, we just keep, well, that's how we always do it. And candidly in that situation, the workers like the poll. <laughs> they liked yeah. gathering around and chatting. So there was also that change that has, which it's just this kind of question. I mean, that's an obvious, this doesn't seem terribly efficient, but you can also see where there's going to be resistance to change. So when you do challenge, you know, why we are doing this all the way, you know, also embrace that, you know, most people don't wake up and saying, I need to be different today. Um, and so, you know, you really need to assess the change um, you know, the aptitude for change, the digestibility for change or consumption, I should say. Yeah. And it, it's funny you say that because when, as you were telling that story, the first thing I thought about was the scheduling guy and the scheduling guy is probably going to be the first one to resist that change because, you know, you, it's, it's a heroic sort of a job, right? He's despite all these limitations of data and systems and processes and manual stuff, he or she is now making still making it happen. And so that those heroics go away if you start to automate that person's process. So you have to think about it from a change perspective too, and not, not assume necessarily that the scheduling guy is going to love it because it's going to make his job easier. He's not going to love it because now he's going to question his value to the organization. And so 
it might be best for the organization, but you know, that's, that's sort of the change management nuance that a lot of organizations overlook. Yeah, no, that's absolutely, absolutely critical. And whether that's a scheduling guy or a reporting guy or somebody, you know, or, you know, who's heading up your shop floor, um, even facilities, there is always going to be a certain resistance to change. And so it's important to frame that questioning in a respect based way um, that actually focuses on the outcome, not necessarily the people doing it. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, very much so. Um, I want to hit a, a couple of comments here on uh, various platforms here. There was one I had here that I wanted to pull up. Where is it? Bear with me. I just lost it. Here's This isn't the one I was looking for, but this is just a thoughtful comment that I want to include here and thank the person. Uh, this is Snehit on um, YouTube says, I am Snehit, an MBA student from India. Your weekly sessions are incredibly informative and enlightening. So thank you for that. That's I love hearing that sort of feedback. So I'm glad you listen often and find this info helpful. And I hope you continue to do so. Um, Kyler, just to close a loop on this, Kyler does come back to the sock uh, analogy and she feels like socks are a complex issue in her household. So uh, <laughs> you really hit a nerve there with the, the sock analogy um, there. But <laughs> wait, <laughs> wait, Kyler, until you've got, you know, pro, you know, kids on sports teams, then you the whole sock thing really expands. Yeah. Oh. How old are your kids, Kristen? Uh, mine are 22. I have twins. Uh, oh, but okay. yeah, but you know, especially on varsity teams, you know, then you've got, you know, certain colors. I, I've never seen, I did not know there's a whole fashion choice in your tube socks. Yes. I don't even really call them tube socks anymore. Uh, but you know, there's probably a cooler name than that that you and I are not privy to, but uh, <laughs> I've got two. Teenage well, boys that are in sports. I, I feel really bad for my wife who has to deal with the sock situation in our household. So <laughs> I, I do not typically deal with that. <laughs> well, thank you to Kristen and Eric. Always not only a wealth of knowledge, but one of our most entertaining interviews um, of the year as well. So I hope you enjoyed my top five list. As a reminder, that is 135. Um, and if you have any feedback on this top five list, I'd love to hear it in the comments here. Um, and I hope you enjoyed all of the great content we worked hard to put together and bring to you in 2023. Um, and thank you so much for Eric in hosting all of these interviews. And we look forward to another great interview season in 2024.